So I guess start recording. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. So uh, just a, a quick roll call here. We have Councilperson Dominique Johnson, Councilperson Lisa Shanahan, Councilperson Tom Keegan, and Councilperson Nick Saccinelli uh, present. Um, just uh, we'll do a approval of the June 24th minutes. Would anybody like to move that item? Uh, Lisa, Ms. Shanahan, um, any any comments, corrections, omissions that we need to address? I was not there present for that meeting, unfortunately. So if, uh, I'll let you all take the lead. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Oh, thank you, Chair. I also see Diana Rebelus, I believe, is present, but maybe not on camera or, or audio. Oh. But I'm not sure. Let me uh, scan over. Yes, let the, thank you. Let the record show that Diana Revolus is present. I believe there is also a edit for the minutes, but of course I'm trying to find it right now and I lost it. Um, so give me a second. <laughs> uh, Not a problem. We could, we could always circle back to, or- Okay, you, that sounds good. Appreciate we that. Could, we could submit it in writing and have it corrected for the record. Very good. It was just a typo, so not- Typographical? All right, fantastic. Thank you. Um, any other corrections? We have a motion on the floor, all in favor of passing the minutes from June 24th, 2021 meeting. Um, any, uh, any of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna abstain. It looks like we're all in favor. I'm abstaining for the record. <laughs> all right, uh, public participation. Do we have anybody waiting in the wings? I don't know. Who's running IT tonight? I'm Tyler. Hey, Tyler. Is there, is there anybody waiting as an attendee that like to uh, that would like to speak? If anybody would like to speak, you can just uh, click the raise your hand button on Zoom and I'll let you speak. All right. Okay. Sorry, with... guys, my computer was not working. I'm trying to make it still work. I'm sorry. No, no. not a problem. All right. I don't see anyone raising their hand. So moving forward. Uh, so new business this evening, we'll start with the police department item 1A and 1B. Authorize the mayor Herod W. Rilling to execute any and all documents necessary to apply, accept, and implement grant funds for the state of Connecticut Department of Transportation under the Highway Safety Grant for Distracted Driving High Visibility Enforcement Program in the amount of $50,000. Item 1B, authorize the police chief Thomas Kahala to execute any and all agreements, uh, documents, instruments, and amendments there too is maybe necessary to implement the 2021 Distracted Driving High Visibility Enforcement Program pursuant to such grant funding. Maybe we'd like to move these items. Uh, Ms. Rebelus, thank you. Uh, and then who do we have to speak on these items this evening? Uh, Lieutenant Ranzinski from the police department, sir. How are you, sir? Good, uh, you would, you like to, would you like to give a, a brief background on the, the item? Yes, it's uh, state funding. And what we do is we focus on um, drivers using their cell phones, talking and texting. Um, this is a 100% cost grant. It comes in from the state. There is no matching funds needed from the police department. And uh, we've had some good success with it. Um, people are starting to get the message. So it's a, it's a worthwhile program. It gets our officers out there. And uh, especially after post pandemic, it's a uh, good that they're seen with the, uh, the traffic enforcement and the traffic's been picking up a lot lately. So this will be helpful. Excellent, a discussion from the committee? Questions? Uh, Mr. Keegan. Yeah, just a, a statement, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe, Lieutenant, this is also one of the statutes where uh, the city gets some of the revenue from the uh, summonses, is that correct? Uh, eventually going through the system, Mr. Keegan, get a percentage of the monies from that. Thank you. Any other questions, discussion? I'm very familiar with the item. Uh, this is something that we, we do fairly regularly and I know is very useful for the police department. Thank you for presenting on the item. We have a motion on the floor, all in favor? All right. Uh, abstentions? Then you abstain? You're in favor? All right, so, so it's unanimous, thank you. I think you're muted. My computer's acting up, my computer. 
computer. Yeah, I, I know. I, I know the frustration. I, 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 if you're on Optimum, I, I got a notification earlier today that there's an outage. So, um, anybody on Optimum, <laughs> heads I have up. to switch off to my phone. I'm going to try again. Not a problem. So, but that those those items were moved together, and all that was a unanimous vote. Uh, I'm going to move to item two A and two B. Authorize the mayor Harry W. Rilling to execute any and all documents necessary to apply, accept, and implement grant funding from FEMA under the 2021 Port Security Grant. Item 2B, authorize the police chief Thomas Kaholik to execute any and all agreements, documents, instruments, amendments thereto as may be necessary to implement the 2021 Port Security Grant pursuant to such grant funding. Anybody like to move that item? Uh, Mr. Keegan, thank you. Uh, and who's uh, speaking on this item this evening? Uh, Lieutenant Ronzinski from the police department. Um, our portion of the grant, um, we're targeting our funding for our scuba team and getting upgrades with our scuba equipment, which is uh, much needed. Uh, the team's been going through a, a series of, we've been upgrading, rebuilding the team. Um, this equipment will give us uh, probably one of the leads in the area as far as our dive capabilities. And uh, recently the Wilton Police Department uh, disbanded their dive team. So regionally, this is going to put us in a better position to uh, serve the city and serve the area. Thank you. Any questions, discussion from the committee? All right. And I actually, I, I neglected to move 2C along with that one, but we will just move it separately and vote on it separately, although it, uh, it is associated with that directly. Uh, we have a motion on the floor for the for 2A and 2B currently. Um, all in favor? That's unanimous. And I will move 2C for the sake of process. Authorize the, the fire chief, uh, Gino Gatto, to execute any and all agreements, documents, instruments, and amendments thereto as may be necessary to implement the 2021 Port Security Grant pursuant to such grant funding. Uh, I'll move that item. Um, and uh, any discussion on 2C? Same. Okay, all in favor? All right, it's unanimous again, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. So we'll move on to the fire department. Item three, authorize Mayor Harry W. Rilling uh, to execute any and all documents necessary to adopt the Western Connecticut Council of Government or WestCog Multi-Jurisdiction multi Hazard Mitigation Plan Update 2021 through 2026 as prepared by the WestCog and approved by Federal Emergency Management Agency FEMA. <laughs> Um, anybody would like to move this item? Uh, Ms. Shanahan, thank you. And then who will be speaking on this? I think Mich Michelle, you're on? I am. Good evening, How everybody. Good. Um, so this is actually a document we do every five years. Uh, the West, Western Connecticut Council of Governments used to be SWERPA. Um, they received funding to do this as a multi-jurisdictional plan. Um, and basically, there's the public meetings, public comments, a series of workshops um, that we do kind of individually and then a, as a group uh, to create the plan. Um, and ultimately, this allows us to apply for any kind of mitigation funds um, when they become available. So you have to have a FEMA approved and adopted plan in order to apply for hazard mitigation funding. And that's... So again, the, the current one expires in December, and we're just going through the adoption of this one that will get us through 2025, if my math is correct. 2026. 2026. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions, discussion? Uh, Ms. Johnson. Thanks, Chair. I, just a real quick question. Thank you for this. And I, I assume that because of the language in here, this is one of the ways in which our city can respond to and mitigate the effects of climate change. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah, I, yep. Actually, some of the newer hazard mitigation grants do, do allow for climate change projects. Previously, they really were focused on some of the infrastructure um, buyback pro or buyout programs. Um, but again, now we're starting to see more focus on climate change, which I, which I love. Um, so we are gonna look at that as well as uh, feature grants come out. Fabulous. And this obviously then helps us 
make sure we can get those grants, which is great. So I appreciate all your work. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Luca, how 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 dramatic did these change in in from the last one? How long how how long was the last one in place? Is, you said five years. Uh, correct. So twenty sixteen to twenty twenty one. Um, so again, really every five years. A lot of times we'll make some small changes. So again, if for example in the 2016, 2021 version, um, we may have had some projects identified that now that they're completed, we would move off of those priorities and then we could add new projects. So we also keep the language generic enough that even if something came up that we really wanted to focus on, um, again, maybe it's a massive hurricane that hits us in two years and it shows a problem, then again, the language is again, broad enough that we can actually do some mitigation projects for that still under the plan. So again, there are some things that are a little bit more specific and then others, again, it's broad enough that we have some flexibility for, for projects. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions, discussion? All right, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor with a show of hands. All right, and we're unanimous. The uh, screens keep changing where everyone's located, so <laughs> I have to hunt everyone down. All right, so moving on to the uh, the discussion item, and thank, thank you, Mr. Luca, for that. Moving on to the next discussion item, this was actually brought up in a another meeting. I'm not 100% uh, sure which committee we were discussing it in, but by Ms. Revolus. Um, and we, it was requested that we uh, uh, review our mental health and substance use uh, planning, programming, and availability. What, what, what resources do we have to, to the city? Um, so Ms. Dia Moore reached out and, and set up a presentation for this evening. And would you, guys, would, you, would you be willing to introduce yourselves? I can um, pass it on to you. So I um, want to first introduce Margaret Watt. Um, she is the Prevention De Director for Positive Directions, the Center for Prevention and Counseling. Hi, and everyone. Also, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, go. <laughs> and also Daniela um, Arias is a program coordinator for the Hub, which is the uh, Regional Behavioral Health Action Organization for Southwestern Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the floor, The floor is yours. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, we put together a little presentation. I don't know if it's possible for me to share my screen. Uh, yep, you you have permission. So if you want to hit that green share screen button, uh, you should be good to go. Okay, great. Okay, can everyone see this? Great. Okay, so I'm going to give more of a generalized kind of overview of the region. Uh, Margaret will then get into the specifics and more uh, statistics of Norwalk. So for the region, the hub actually just completed their regional priority report, which happens every two years. Um, we focus on the 14 towns in southwestern Connecticut from Greenwich to Stratford. Um, as we concluded, the top three regional priorities this year were um, for 2020 were mental health, suicide, and alcohol. Uh, mental health continue and suicide continues to be a huge concern um, across all ages, but especially through youth. And there's a large concern during um, the pandemic. Um, for suicide, all 13 out of 14 towns in southwestern Connecticut actually experienced a suicide, even though the CDC, um, DPH, excuse me, uh, reported a decrease of suicides during the few months of the heightened pandemic in 2020. And then alcohol, um, due to the accessibility now, being able to get it, take it to go from restaurants and even ordering it on things like Uber Eats. So some of our findings um, concluded that there was an increase in mental health illness, mental illness among youth, young adults and adults, um, anxiety and depression among youth, young adults and adults, vaping marijuana and overdose deaths involving fentanyl. 
Um, there has been a decrease in vaping among youth and young adults. Um, it is still largely an issue, but there may have been a decrease due to, due to the pandemic and the isolation, such as youth and young adults not having that access during the pandemic and being afraid to share with others um, due to the nature of catching the um, COVID-19. There also has been a decrease in perception of harm from marijuana from both adults and youth. Um, and that has a lot to do with now the legalization of it. So some regional recommendations we've concluded for mental health and suicide, um, focusing on prevention, uh, social emotional, emotional initiatives in schools and communities, education and awareness, um, screening, social media buys, um, continuing with the Regional Suicide Advisory Board, which we have here um, in Southwestern Connecticut, um, and promoting uh, educational programs and trainings such as mental health first aid, uh, QPR, which is question per se refer, um, a suicide prevention training, safe talk, and assist. For treatment, we concluded um, provider education improved discharge planning, first episode psychosis program, um, there is one in the state that is supposed to be statewide, but the issue is they don't come down to our region. So it would be great if we had something down here in Southwestern Connecticut. Um, expanding and offering services, resources during late night hours and weekends, um, and hiring more bilingual or multilingual providers. For recovery, um, advocating for a regional peer respite, support groups, sustainability of facilitators, um, maintain use of telehealth that has um, been largely positively taken by the region. Um, more people are using services because they have access on their computer, on their phone, or they feel more comfortable instead of going and creating those appointments, having to go in person and talking to someone one-on-one -on -one, um, in person. Um, form more community partnerships, specifically with faith communities, uh, create more efforts towards subgroups and underserved populations in awareness, treatment, and education. Recommendations we concluded for substance misuse for prevention included sharing of local campaigns, regional youth train for alcohol compli compliance, education on marijuana and CBD oil, integrated screening programs, and community um, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, um, continuing to support um, community stakeholders such as the local part, um, the Norwalk Partnership, which is the local prevention um, council in Norwalk. For treatment, um, addressing those with untreated alcohol use disorders, review of medical marijuana in the region, addressing problems solved around alcohol use disorder, particularly among people who are not ready for treatment, and encouraging providers to expand their services to children and teens. For recovery, sober house standards, awareness of Connecticut addiction services website, the continue the use of Narcan, smart recovery and recovery coaches, improve updates on bed availability websites to be more accurate, and again, maintaining the use of telehealth. And I'm going to pass it on to Margaret. Awesome. Thanks, Daniela. Um, you know, so we split this up actually so that you would hear kind of the regional piece first from Southwest Connecticut before we get into Norwalk. So I just want to give everyone a chance to ask Danielle any questions before I go local. All right, I will go ahead and talk through my slides and we'll sort of hope there's Q&A at the end. Um, and I want to just thank Daniela for, or Diana for, you know, bringing this to your attention. Um, so I'm Margaret Watt. I'm the Prevention Director of Positive Directions. We're a nonprofit behavioral health um, organization on the Norwalk Westport border, serving mostly Norwalk. Um, and we work across prevention, treatment, and recovery. But I'm here tonight because of the Norwalk Partnership, which is the local coalition to um, address substance misuse in youth and young adults. And um, I'm also a Norwalk resident, by the way. Uh, you know what, I, oh, cause this is Danielle, this is you sharing your screen. So I'll just tell you when I need the next slide, I guess. <laughs> okay, um, All right. sounds good. Yeah, that works, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so just to make, I, would, I do wanna make sure everybody knows about the Norwalk partnership. Uh, Norwalk for a long time, like decades has had a prevention coalition um, that has been run out of Human Services Council. 
Um, it had pretty limited funding from the city and from the state. So, you know, they all, they, they're the ones who always do like family day and backpack drives and things like that uh, and support some of the work they do at the school-based health centers. But what's exciting is a couple of years ago, Positive Directions was able to get the Federal Drug-Free Communities Grant um, based on doing a youth survey in 2018, which was a precursor. We brought in that money. And then last year, when I started at, at Positive Directions, because um, I used to work at the hub where Daniela is, um, I was able to create a merged, you know, Positive Directions worked with HSC and we merged the, the towns, the city's um, coalition. So we really want to make sure you guys all know there is no more you know, Mid-Fairfield Substance Abuse Coalition over at HSC. Um, it's one thing called the Norwalk Partnership. We have a website, which we've never had before. We've um, been there. We're just completing our first year. And in this first year, because of the federal money, we've been able to conduct youth and community surveys, which I want to share the data from. We've been able to do a lot more work, like developing campaigns, um, building the website, just doing a lot more with that money. So the data I'm going to show you tonight came through the Drug-Free Communities Grant that I manage. Um, and one thing I want to let you know is my role at, at PD is prevention director focused more on the substance use side. I also do a lot of work around suicide prevention. And we've purposefully aligned, um, planned for this data to come in and be used by the schools and by Norwalk Act and by um, the Norwalk Partnership. So we're all benefiting equally from the data that we were able to fund and gather. Um, and we've aligned our work plans in all those areas around mental health and substance use based on this data. So, oh, sorry, next slide. All right, so just some statistics that are local and recent. Um, in our community survey this past spring, Norwalk adults were given the choice of saying, of, you know, how, what has, COVID affected the most in your life? And it could be financial, um, housing security, schooling, et cetera. But the number one thing they all picked was their emotional well-being, with almost half saying it had a negative impact on them. We also actually put a clinical screening tool into our community survey. So 34% um, of people were reporting anxiety and 30% were reporting depression. As comparison, in pre-COVID times, you usually have about 17%, really half of that having anxiety. And in Connecticut, usually about 18% of adults reports depression. So that's a significant increase. Um, you can see here, there's been an impact on relationships with family and friends among adults. Of course, the same thing, even worse really with youth. And um, just over a fifth reported poorer access to mental health services, even though many other people said they had better access because of telehealth. Next slide. So then our youth mental health, our, our youth survey, talking about mental health there, we surveyed seventh through 12th graders right in June at the last couple of weeks of school. Um, we asked them about stress, relationships with teachers, family, friends. Um, I'm just going to hit a couple highlights, but if anyone wants to hear all the data we're presenting in our coalition meeting next Wednesday, and I can send you that info. Um, but as you can see, about three quarters found the pandemic very stressful more than half do not feel connected to other kids at school. 40% um, overall, 39% reported depression, but it was basically a third of all middle schoolers and almost half of high schoolers. And the next um, bullets are the really terrifying ones. Um, thanks, Daniela. So we had 13% of our seventh through 12th graders who reported that they had had suicidal ideation in the last year and 7% of them had made an attempt. Um, in fact, 1% had actually made multiple attempts. So, you know, thank God we did not lose any kids this past year, um, but addressing suicidality and depression is just absolutely critical. Next. I also wanna highlight um, how important it is to look at really who's experiencing this the most. So what you can see here is for the overall depression rate in our youth, which was 39%, here are the groups um, that had 43 to 49%. So the 43% is everybody in the first bullet, 49% are the girls in the last bullet. It's basically half of girls depressed, okay? Um, and next, the highest risk group in our survey was 
students identifying in the LGBTQ community, where as you can see, more than 70% reported depression. So it was 70% of LGB and like 76% of those who identify as transsexual. Um, one fifth of them made, an, made a suicide attempt. So this is an enormous, enormous issue that we need to, you know, this is a community we need to reach out to and support. Also something very important to know is in this survey where we surveyed over 2,500 kids, grades seven through 12, 29% of them identified as LGBTQ. So basically almost a third. And so one fifth of a third attempted suicide on, in this measure. Next. Moving on to substance use in Norwalk. So this is, this is slightly different from what um, the hub found at the regional level. We did a, our community survey last March. We really didn't get a huge response rate, so we can't generalize too much. Um, but we asked um, community members a lot of questions, but some of them were, you know, whether they were using these substances that you can see here, less or more or the same. So a couple of things I wanna highlight um, on the first row, 30% of Norwalkers don't use alcohol. Um, and the majority of Norwalkers don't use nicotine or vapes or marijuana or, or misuse prescription drugs. Those are the things we asked about in alignment with Lake Art grant requirements. Um, the 30% not drinking is actually kind of a common statistic. You usually have nationally reports about a third drink, about a third don't drink, and about a third are problem drinkers. What's interesting is if you look at the column that says less and more, the percentages are pretty similar. So we actually had 18% of Norwalkers that responded saying they were drinking less and 18% drinking more. So different 18%. Um, overall, what it looks like here is there was maybe a slight decrease in total substance use. And a lot of that may have been people just not leaving the house, right? And not having social opportunities. Next. Okay. There's a quick question on this slide. What, what's the sample size? So this one, the, this adult survey is only 292. I have that down at the bottom. So oh, that was not oh, a huge sample. Thank you. Yeah, the, the youth survey is incredibly robust. It's 44% of the entire student body. Oh, okay, thank you. Which is over 2,500 kids. Um, next, please. So now youth substance use, um, compared with the, the one and only other previous survey, which was 2018, substance use had decreased. I think, again, kids didn't have social opportunities and they were mostly at home. Um, I will say, however, I conducted this same survey in a couple of other towns and rates decreased and were actually quite concerning in some of those towns. So, so this is good for us in Norwalk. Um, alcohol is the number one substance. We have just about a quarter of our seniors that were drinking um, during COVID, right? Again, so with less access. So I think we should assume that when things open up more, there will be an increase. As a comparison, in 2018, we didn't survey every year. We surveyed every other grade. So in 2018, juniors in Norwalk, um, it was 40% of them were drinking. So that was a third higher than the state average for juniors at that time. So these rates are really quite a bit lower. However, those who drink also use other substances, including 10% of those who drink also using prescri misusing prescription drugs. Um, and we have significantly higher rates than what you see on the screen for the LGBTQ population, students with depression, special ed, financial strain, and girls. So these are all things we just, I presented sort of more length to the Board of Ed last week. We have work plans with them. Um, it's really important to address sort of to do sort of universal education, but also targeting the groups that are struggling the most. Next. Want to share some of the um, sort of knowledge and attitudes that we gathered. So in Norwalk, um, we had almost a third of adults think that drinking alcohol is a normal part of growing up. Um, fewer think marijuana is a normal part of growing up. See, this is something that may change with the legalization of retail sales for next year and adult use now. Um, you can see 43% think it's common to see alcohol being consumed at Norwalk beaches, which is obviously allowed since it's for sale there. Um, of more concern, 23% think alcohol is, use is common on school grounds during band and sports events. Um, for those last two bullets that I just read, those are from our community survey with adults, but we did focus groups with youth and they also reported the same thing. 
Um, and going back to the beaches for a moment, we've had we've had some coalition members who are sort of regularly staying in touch and talking about how after hours, um, there's one guy who works on some kind of patrol and like a community patrol type thing. And they see kids jumping fences or going in the beaches or drinking or, you know, behind the buildings. And so um, I think, you know, it's in terms of our work plan for the Norwalk Partnership, one of the things we want to look at is where are kids doing things that we can sort of, you know, address. Um, a couple of perceptions among teens that are of concern. These two bullets are are what we call perception of harm measures, which are common in prevention work. So we have a lot of kids who don't think binge drinking is dangerous when it's actually significantly risky. And also about a third of kids who don't think using marijuana one to two times a week is risky. So in case anyone you know, isn't aware, um, which you may not be because you're probably not working in this field specifically, if teens who use marijuana a couple times a week with today's marijuana, which is you know, genetically engineered to be way stronger than anything anyone may have experienced back in their own school date years. Um, they are susceptible to a six to eight point IQ loss. There is increased chance, significant increased chance of addiction, increased chance of psychosis. Um, it's quite risky. Uh, so this is something we need to raise awareness about. Next. And, and then this is maybe relevant, especially for, you know, common council members. Um, a third of adults in Norwalk don't know about the social host law, which has been in place for a number of years, which says that if, if underage minors are drinking on your property, on a property that you control, whether you own or rent it, um, whether or not you knew about it, you can be held liable for it. Uh, and you can actually be held liable and fined or even get up to a year in prison for every person who is there drinking underage. Um, and so it's one of the ways, one of those sort of laws that you use to kind of prevent these behaviors that really are risky. Um, a lot of the adults didn't know that the legal age for tobacco was 21, which changed actually a couple of years ago. So now we have marijuana, alcohol, and tobacco all having the same legal age. So one of the things you'll see in, I think the next slide is we wanna talk about signage and things like that in town. And so going on to the next slide, um, these are some of the things that, that in our work around both mental health and substance use with the Norwalk Partnership and Norwalk Act, um, we have a lot of recommendations, we have work plans. What I'm trying to put here are things that I think maybe your committee can be looking at and supporting and working with us on. Um, so with so much depression out there and so much suicidality, it's unrealistic to think that everyone is going to go have a counselor, right? Number one, there aren't enough. Number two, it just, it's not logical, right? We have to create a healthier environment. So there are, people are isolated and that's one of the factors creating depression. So there are these things called uh, friendship benches that are staffed by volunteers that get some training and peer support. New York City does it, Norwalk could do it. Um, I go to the, the, the town green a lot with my dogs and I'm always like, why are all the benches individual? Nothing faces anything. Nobody, there's no place for like two people to sit down and play chess like you see all over many other cities. So those are things that could create natural outdoors, COVID friendly um, supports. A lot of local towns have teen centers with the level of kids saying that they feel disconnected. That would be a huge thing to work towards, I think. Um, you can see some of the bullets under social supports. It's going to be really critical, I think, for the city. And I say this as a resident and a parent and you know, not just a professional to, to address the needs of our high risk groups. So the LGBTQ community, we have Triangle Community Center right here. Can we have gender neutral bathrooms all over the city? Can we have signs that say all are welcome here? Can everybody who works for the city or volunteers for the city do some LGBTQ cultural humility training and get and learn about pronouns and ways to talk and just learn concepts that are that are, that, that are foreign to a lot of adults but are really pretty common for kids, right? Um, and I would say a lot of that applies to many of our cultural groups, the Haitian community, the Spanish, the Hispanic community, etc. Um, at the bottom here, it says mental health and suicide prevention. So one thing that uh, Deanna knows about, like 
and I've talked about in the past, um, a couple of years ago, the state sent signs to the different cities where someone had died by or made an attempt to jump off a bridge. And these are signs that you're supposed to put on the bridge that say like, here's the National Suicide Lifeline. So first of all, in Norwalk, one of those signs at least is under the bridge. And we've been trying to get that moved for like two years now because it's supposed to be on top of the bridge. So it's a last chance message for someone who's desperate. Number two, as of next summer, the National Suicide Lifeline is going to change to the three digit number 988. So this is an opportunity. Um, we've already got materials that we're trying to get out there about the new number, but um, we should have, I think Norwalk as a city should have these signs like permanent signs everywhere. The mall, when it was built and I walked through it the first time, you know, people have jumped to their death in Stanford Mall, in Danbury Mall a few times. Our mall is extremely high risk. I think we need to train everyone who works there in suicide prevention, have signage and think about actual environmental supports. Um, and this last bullet over here on the left that I wanna talk about is I know you're probably going to say, what are the resources for mental health and substance use in the city and the region? And I've got that on the next slide. Just a couple, it's two easy links. It's the Norwalk Partnership link and the Hub link. But one thing you all may not be aware of that, um, that I think Deanna and I found out at the same time a couple of weeks ago in Norwalk Hospital is they are planning to move their psych beds uh, to Danbury Hospital. They are planning to increase outpatient psychiatric support here in Norwalk. Um, but moving the psychiatric beds to Danbury Hospital is going to be a net loss to Norwalk. It's already a problem that people can't get hospital, hospital level care when they need it. It's already a problem when people have to go to Danbury. Um, but I also think a lot of people when they're having a psych emergency, what they need is a crisis stabilization unit, a respite, a peer respite. And I think I am happy to talk about that at length with anyone, but we can all be advocating for that. Um, so finally, you've probably been like, as I'm talking, you're probably looking at the substance use side of the slide. Um, and uh, here are some things that the city can help with. And I know um, Diana is an active part of the Norwalk Partnership and she's in our marijuana and our alcohol subcommittees. And we were talking about, you know, so if, if people are, if we know people are drinking and using at the beaches, what can we do about lighting? What can we do? Lighting and sign, lighting is light and police patrols are when kids are going after dark, right? Or after it's closed. What about just general signage that says, you know, to parents who may be drinking because they bought something at Ripka's, um, but it just says like these reminders that are like reminder, you know, keep, let's keep our kids safe, no substance use before age 21. Um, and these could be, you know, we might wanna have some traditional signs around the city, but also we were talking about the digital signs that we see you know, on the side of the mall or in front of the high schools. And if there were some, if there's a possibility of having those, di those movable digital signs, we could run sort of constant campaigns around different health, mental health, substance use um, information that people need to know um, because we there are a lot of campaigns out there. It'd be a great way to get them to people. Um, I also just wanna comment on bullet three here. With the new marijuana law that, that got passed and went into effect on July 1st, um, we don't have, we have adult use is legal. We don't have sales yet. We have sales starting next year, um, which means, well, you, you've all seen how many new vape shops and hookah shops and ads for Delta 8 and all this stuff. It's all there. They're all ready to sell marijuana, right? You've probably read that a lot of local communities in the state are deciding that they are locally going to ban marijuana sales, just basically either to protect youth, because the more you normalize it, um, the more you think it's okay, even though it's still illegal for them, or there are options to pass ordinances around making these things be so discreet that you have to go looking for them. I would say right now, walking through South Norwalk is just like everything is in your face everywhere. Um, and so I want to go back to that statistic that showed that basically 60 plus percent of Norwalkers don't use marijuana. So I know that um, a lot of people are thinking, oh, this is gonna bring in a lot of revenue and this is something everyone wants. Well, what does happen when you legalize it is you do have somewhat more use. You absolutely have more kids using and more negative effects on them. So I think anything we can do to minimize, like to, 
to not make it more normal, to just like, if it's legal, like when I think about when the medical marijuana dispensary opened up in Westport, you have to know where it is. You don't see evidence of it driving around. So you can go get there. If you're legal to use it, you can go and find it. But kids aren't seeing it in their face all the time. So that's something else I wanted to say. And next slide is almost the last one, you guys. So if you are looking for behavioral health services or supports, I just want to point out that on the Norwalk Partnership website, there's a Get Help page um, where I actually, I don't, I'm not controlling the uh, screen right now, but we could show it to you. Um, you can download resource lists in English or Spanish of all, all the supports that are literally here in Norwalk. You can look at them on the screen with a bit of description of what each one offers. Um, so things are visible right there, a great resource anytime you need it and downloadable. And that's all specific to Norwalk. And then the hub um, where Daniela works has a broader list, which is like the whole region. So if you're looking for something, can't find it in Norwalk, you can find it in other parts of Southwest Connecticut. And I think the next slide just says questions, right? Oh no, Daniela, you wanna comment on this? Yeah, sorry. Um, so the hub, we created infographics from our priority report, but these are things that you can also download on our website and print them out and hand them out and distribute them however you would like. This one's specific to mental health. Um, there are resources there in the middle and on the right that we're constantly updating. So, oh, and the reminder on this question screen is, as members of the Norwalk community, if you guys would subscribe to the Norwalk Partnership blog or follow us on Facebook and Instagram, it's a great way to just sort of find out new ideas or resources or programs or share them with your constituents. Um, Fantastic, thank you. You bet. So, let's, yeah, let's open the floor to discussion. Any question? I have, I'll ask the first question. Uh, Deanna, is this on the city website? Any of this on the city website? The presentation or the, the resources? All of the, all of the, res, the resource, the contacts, the uh, websites. Yeah, we've um, included some resources on, on our COVID page, but um, I can talk to Lamond about um, if there's another place if we want to place it on the city website. I've, Deanna, I've asked the city to link to the Norwalk partnership and I think it is linked somewhere there because it's, because why reinvent the wheel, right? Everything is literally right there for mental health and substance use. Um, I know community services is trying to build out a new website and I've talked to them about that and just saying wherever you can link to the existing stuff is better than duplicating because then everyone has to update everything. Michelle. I think, yeah, I was going to say, in particular, I took a picture of it. I thought the last slide was so helpful. That would be really great to have somewhere because it's kind of a summary of everything that you need to know about how to find help. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Any other questions? Ms. Revolus. I guess. Um, so thank you for all that and my NORA partnership guys as well. Um, I'm going to say a few things for you. Uh, first of all, um, that was an amazing presentation. Um, you did a great job. Secondly, I don't want to overlook what was just said, and I really want to speak to the community that, that that happens to a lot. Black people were on top of that too. And I really want people to understand there is a sensitivity there. And especially then being the next situation of the LGBTQ community, there are Black people that encompass that before sexuality, there's race, um, there's who we are. And then on top of that, I also want to ask if there's also cultural sensitivities connected to that, because I've gotten some calls that would be what is the, the um, clash because there are cultural sensitivities that is like it's not that we won't accept but you're not all you're also overlooking where we are and what we come from right then now second now thirdly with the signs 
Um, I brought that up before, right? And we had that conversation. And I think digital signage would also be a great way of um, even bringing up revenue. I think that if we have like the mall, for example, or the um, uh, DMV, I think those are two great places that would have good signage right there that not only those places in between, but just straight in your face of different things that happen in Norwalk. And people can actually probably maybe put a little, you know, payment towards throwing something up there, for example. You know what I mean? Um, digital signage not only can be festive, it can also be informative and um, and also that uplifting spirit stuff just from our, um, our town, our councils, engaging with our community before and after, like, elections. So um, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the signs. I want to just add maybe thinking of cultural sensitivities and not, and we put it out there, we heard it, I just don't want it to get overlooked. There are children out here that really are suffering just because of the way they look. That's something I can't change, I can't wash, I can't do anything. And they really get subjugated to um, sexualizations, um, Oh, uh, masculations, um, um, education divides, um, health, so on and so ever. So um, as an overall hold, I just want to speak to that. You guys did an amazing job. And to my council, that's all I want to say. We should get some digital signs. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I was Johnson. I, I want to thank you all so much for this presentation. Thanks for Deanna, Chair Sakanelli, for bringing this for us. I know, like so many New Yorkers, when we saw that data come out, I think in the paper for the first time from the presentation, it stopped so many of us in our tracks. And to my colleague, Dana Revus's point, a lot of us live it and we know this um, as people. And so, you know, as a proud member of the LGBTQ community myself, our, our kids suffer so disproportionately. And this data was even alarming to me. And I, this is something that in my former life, I, I was a researcher in this area. So the pandemic has really brought such pain into so many of our young people's lives that I'm really proud that as a city, hopefully in the next year or two, we can really take a hard look and, and do this work. Um, and for those in my community, like, please read, and you know, I, I'll just speak for myself now, like, please reach out like D Johnson at norwalk.com. If you need anything, I'm here for you as your LGBTQ council person. <laughs> so, but at the same time, Trevor project, for those of you young people, you need somebody to talk to right away. We've got TCC and trans lifeline at translifeline.org will help our trans ch uh, children be able to have a safe space to go because I'm going to, I'm going to close with Diana's point, like cultural sensitivity is something we often don't experience in, in mainstream healthcare at all. And it makes it very difficult for us to find healthcare that sees us for who we are. And I think for the city to take that step, hopefully to make it so that there's not that barrier is going to be really crucial for our kids. So thank you all so much. Ms. Revolus, do you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just giving a little speak truth to power. That's all I was doing. It was <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Any other comments, discussion? Well, thank you again for the presentation. It was outstanding. I think the content was uh, was exactly what we were looking for. What we needed to know. We there was we knew the information was out there. Having it in one place is very useful, and getting it on our website and making sure that the public have has access to it is going to be all that much more useful. So. We do appreciate you coming this evening and thank you for all that you do. Thank you. And can I just um, ask Nick, if I send you some of these files and documents, can you share them with everybody else here? I'll share with the whole council. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Great. And and please just one final plea, like the, the work of the Norwalk Partnership, this is a voluntary effort, right? A coalition is, it's a community coalition. It's all of us working together. We have like this 12 sector approach, but we need more people to make these things happen. So if you like some of those ideas around, you know, like signage and whatever, we want to work with you or come and work at our table. Um, and I really do think that, you know, for the, the cultural humility kinds of training and things, anything that like we're trying to do it at positive directions of like, we're trying to set goals of saying, 
we, you know, it's part of a DEI initiative, right? Like, so what are the different communities that we need to know more about and be trained up in and say, it's not optional, like we all need to do this. Um, no, so. uh, no, that's good. And then, and you did bring up the, the mall as well. Do you have any partnership with anybody at the mall? Do you have contacts at the mall? So Diamond Seed, who is one of our leadership team, um, has some connection to the mall, but it hasn't, it hasn't been fruitful in terms of that yet. So okay, I think so if you I, have... I, I could bridge that gap for you. I, I know the mall is actually passionate about the 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 suicide prevention as well. I've sat in meetings with them, so I could um I could I could arrange that. So uh, anything that you send, send over, Nick, I'll, I'll. You're amazing. I was just gonna say yay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, do we have it? I was just gonna say, do we have a link? And you just jumped on that. So that's amazing. Absolutely, that yeah, would be I'd, great. I'd be happy, happy to arrange that. And, and I guess one, one bullet that I realized I skipped, but I did want to say, because I'm like, when I'm in front of a group of Norwalk hunters, I'm like, all of you guys, please get suicide prevention trained. Like I run suicide prevention trainings all the time. The hub does. I just did one this week. Just they're for the general public, anyone 16 and up. But with this level of suicidal ideation and attempt, there's just really no reason everyone hasn't gone to a training to feel like they're like able to have that conversation because it could be your kid and it could be your spouse and it could be your mom, right? Yeah. Miss Revolus. I'm so sorry. I did think of just one thing right now with the with what with what you said about the bridges. Is it because the way that our fencing is over the bridges is that why our sign is below it? Like we've made obviously a um attemptive measures to make sure people can't even climb over, but even in doing that, so you know, like all our fences kind of curve why would then our signs be below it? Because we made the attempt for the fence to go up and curve. So although I like digital signage, I'm just kind of going back to maybe well before my time being here. Why are the signs below the bridge if we've obviously made attempts to make sure people don't go over the bridge? Um, Maria Escalera from Community Services is the last person that I'd been talking to about it. And she tried to dig into it. And she said it's because so I guess the bridges are controlled by, are not controlled by Norwalk. They're controlled by like DOL or I don't know, DOT or somebody okay. at the state level. And That's so I guess Norwalk, probably DPW or someone put the signs where they had control over them. Um, but I can, I, it's, you know, I did not know that was the barrier. Cause if I know that I can go back to the state suicide advisory board that sent the signs and I know all those guys and work with them. And so does Daniela, actually, we could just say to them, then you guys make that fix. <laughs> I, I don't know how many of you in Stanford too. So yeah, it is through the state, like the city doesn't really have much to say because we had to issue by exit nine as well. And that was my teacher. That was my teacher. Yeah, an old teacher of mine. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's actually why I'm yeah. wondering that because that was an old teacher that was Really, that was cool. awful. He yeah. was really well. Close then, to so the state shouldn't have sent the signs to Deanna in the first place. They should have just put them up, right? <laughs> but, mm -hmm. right. Cool. All right. Any uh, any last minute, any uh, remaining comments, questions before we move on to the next item? Do we have connection to the DMV? We could, we could, we could make that connection happen. Yes. Thank yes. You. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you again for coming this evening. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a good night. All right. For, for the uh, the next item uh, listed as coyotes on the discussion, this was uh, brought by Mr. Tom Keegan, and I am going to pass the floor to him to introduce this topic. Mr. Keegan, how are oh. you, sir? Fine. Thank you, Chairman Sachinelli. So anyway, I, I don't think that this... Um, it's fair to just say coyotes. This happened uh, several months ago. When I'm not going to common council committee meetings, I, I do read and I, I look at uh, social media and, and I, I've been seeing as probably all of you have, you know, different neighborhood groups who have encountered different kinds of wildlife, be it in their own backyards or whether they're out in parks and at Cranberry Park and other places. So what really um, was the impetus to this was when the, uh, the black bear was struck by a car up in Easton. And I said, wow, I mean, you know, we're really, um, <laughs> we're really in, in almost a partnership with our wildlife. And 
I expect that a lot of our, our, our um, residents wouldn't know what to do if they encountered a, a coyote or a bear or other kinds of wildlife. Uh, we have bobcats in, in Fairfield County. Uh, there was a mountain lion we thought, you know, several years ago. So there's, there's wildlife here. Um, it's becoming more and more prevalent. So I did speak to uh, Chairman Saccinelli and we, we decided that we would bring it to health and public safety. And I have a, a conversation with our animal control officer today. Uh, thank you, Chief Koholwit, for making him available to me. And uh, it was a real eye opener. It was a, a tutorial. I mean, I thought I knew a little bit about uh, wildlife and what to do if, but boy, oh boy, I learned I don't know much at all. So is, Bob, are you on the, on the call? I, I think we need to move him to a panelist. So uh, if we can move Robert Serco to, yeah. from attendee yep. to panelist, please. You got it. Thank you. Okay, should be good to go. Thanks so much. Anyway, uh, once again, I, I just, I just, uh, Bob, I was telling the panel that uh, we spoke today and uh, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut because uh, I, I, I wanna hear, you know, your, your thoughts and, and your uh, information again on uh, encounters with wildlife in, the, in our parks and things, thanks. You there, Bob? You can give him a minute. Sometimes there's a delay when you're moved to panelists. It says loading on their side. I don't have any fish. I have a cat, but I also, uh, I have any pets on me, but I have some fish. And if you catch them walking in Cranberry Park, well, please get that on YouTube. We'll make some money on that. One. Trust me. <laughs> Don't we have a bear that's pretty famous around here? I think it's, it's called Yogi. A... Yogi Bear. No, no. There's a no. There's a bear. Like I think his number is like two two seven or something like that. He has a page on Facebook. Um, people follow him. He's made it from. Um, all the way in Lynchfield down to Fairfield County. And in like, there's literally a page following this black bear um, who's actually got quite used to us. And he goes in pools, he goes uh, around, but he has a tag, like a tag on his ears. And he looks like, and it's, I think it's numbers 277, I think or either 227 or 277. I don't know, but there's a, there's a page about him. Um, and I definitely know we were, I, I've definitely lived with wildlife out here before. Um, but I think that's actually like, we have a black bear who's quite famous out here. I believe you're right. Yeah, I, it's his, I, I actually gotta go check. I think I'm following the page. I wanna, <laughs> oh, I'm on my phone. I gotta find it. Like um, it's either 211 or something. Well, Robert, are you with us? Can you hear yeah, me? You back? I think so, yes. Oh, okay. oh, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if I may. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Sirico. I am the uh, dog warden or senior animal control officer uh, for the city of Norwalk. And I'm here to address uh, the concerns that public servants or uh, people have had regarding our coyote population uh, in Norwalk. Um, the coyote itself is a 35 to say 40 pound animal brown to tan or gray in color. Um, they do have long-term bonds with, with their mates. Um, they tend to have four to six puppies every year between April and May. Um, they can live as long as 15 years. Uh, they do have large territories. Um, they have always lived in Norwalk in Fairfield County. Um, we've had them, you know, I've been a dog, dog warden for 18 years and we've always had them, they were here before then. Um, the issue we've been having I guess in the last year or so is that even more sightings 
uh, people have been home more often and didn't realize they actually had them living in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, and the coyote by its nature um, are very intelligent, uh, curious uh, creature. Um, they, they investigate things, uh, they, they live by their wits um, and they, they tend to, if they come across something that's new to them, they like to investigate it. Um, you know, we've had a lot of complaints or concerns from people saying that, you know, they have a coyote in their neighborhood who just kind of passed by and when it saw them, it stopped, it looked at them for a while and then it continued on its way. Um, we've never had a coyote in Norwalk or Fairfield County uh, try to attack a person. Um, full disclosure, in the last year or so, maybe almost two years, uh, we've had uh, two smaller dogs that were taken by coyotes. Uh, we had one other dog that was chased by a coyote. Um, all these incidences, uh, there was evidence to show from video or from eyewitnesses accounts that the dogs, the canines, uh, actually initiated the contact with the coyote. Um, you'd have a situation where you'd have a coyote um, in your yard in a wooded area or even field, and you're on your property, and you'd have a smaller dog that was left outside unattended that would see the coyote and run over to it, being a dog. It would run over to the coyote and initiate contact, and the coyote, uh, you know, being a wild animal, would respond, and then the dog um, would, would have an issue or would get himself in trouble. Um, when people call my office, what we try to explain to them is that, you know, we do have coyotes in Norwalk, in Fairfield County, in Connecticut. Um, it's not uncommon to have them out during the daytime uh, or to be in places where it may seem odd, at Cranberry Park or even a cat pasture beach. A uh, cat pasture, we've had them picking through the rock jetties, looking for whatever washes up on shore. Um, they do serve a very important and vital uh part of our ecosystem. You know, they do keep a lot of the other animals that if they, if we weren't and didn't have any coyotes, that if, if they were no coyotes, we'd have an overabundance of a lot of the smaller animals like rabbits or, or mice or rats or chipmunks, because um, that's a big part of the coyotes of, of uh, their, their food sources. Um, the coyote also take a lot of the Older injured deer that get hurt. Um, if there were no coyotes, we'd have an abundance of deer. And people, you know, do have concerns with deer being a problem with, with Lyme disease and other issues that deers have. So they do serve a, a vital role in keeping a checks and balances on our, our wildlife that we have in Connecticut. So they are they are good to have. Um, like any other animal, uh, when people come across them, they, they see the coyote, and by nature, the coyote. You know, they, they're very curious, like I had said before, and they, they tend to stare at people in a very strange, awkward way that make people, people feel uncomfortable. They stare at you. Um, it's not a threat. It's just what they do. Um, most of them have a comfort zone of maybe 20 to 30 feet. Uh, myself, I've, I've been within 20, maybe 15 feet of a coyote, or I'll walk up to it, and then I'll be, I'll be aggressive, or I'll be dominant with it. I'll clap my hands or make a noise. And then it'll retreat to another 10 or 15 feet back. And then it'll stop and look at me again. And then I would walk up to it, it'll approach it again and do the same behavior. And then again, it would back up and then eventually run away. Um, you know, the issue that we do have is that a lot of people, um, they do live in areas that, that are preferred for coyotes. So they'll have situations where they have a bird feeder out or other, you know, attracted. So they'll have a bird feeder or they'll have the garbage which is left out exposed in their garbage cans, or perhaps they may have a shed that is not properly covered on the bottom. So there's, there's a way for the coyotes, prey species like a rabbit or something, the squirrels to get up underneath there and make a home. And that would attract uh, not just coyotes, but other animals that we do also have that live in Norwalk that people are surprised to hear about, that we do have black bear that come and go from Norwalk. We do have bobcat, which can also be quite uh, intimidating or beautiful when they're seen. Um, and we do have a coyote that, that do have resident coyote that live in Norwalk. Um, so when you do see them, the important thing to remember is that the coyote by nature is a very curious, intelligent animal that is also extremely skittish and nervous at all times. And that the last thing it wants to do is have a conflict with a person because it realizes that if it's injured or if it's harmed or hurt, that it would be in trouble itself. So what they're looking for is mostly 
smaller, easier things that they can subside on, like such as mice or rabbits or the occasional injured deer or older deer. Um, they're not actively looking to harm anyone or even our pets. So with that said, if they were to come across an opportunity where if somebody was feeding cats outside and the cats would kind of relax and lay back, the coyote was going to take a cat, it's a small animal, it's under 10 pounds, 15 pounds at the most, easy to take, not a problem for them. If you have a dog that would run up to a coyote, especially a smaller dog, then the dog initiates contact, then there's going to be a problem for the dog, obviously, because like I said, your average coyote is, is at 35 to 40 pounds, depending on you know how they're how they're doing health wise. Um, the best way to deal with coyotes, and there's been studies done where across the nation, this, the federal government has has uh, paid for studies to have to, for coyote management, where they've tried you know euthanizing them, which I don't agree with, but they've tried euthanizing them, they've tried relocating them, um, they've they've done all these things, and you know euthanizing them and relocating them doesn't work. If you euthanize them, the ones that remain because of where the environment is, um, other ones would move in and quickly move in and then they still have coyotes. Um, relocating them, you're just gonna bring them to a location where you would probably think it'd be a good idea for them. But unfortunately, wherever you bring them, there's probably already coyote living there and there's gonna be a conflict that way. Um, the only real way and the safe way and the smart way to deal with coyotes is to be what you would call hazing them or make them feel uncomfortable. So if you come, if you're walking along, say Cranberry Park, and you're with your dog, um, your dog is off leash, they're running around, you see a coyote, the coyote is going to stare at you in a strange, you know, it's kind of an odd way. You want to immediately call your dog back over to you, make sure your dog doesn't run up to the coyote because it's going to be a problem. Your dog listens to you, dog returns to you, you put your dog on a leash, which you should have with you, and then you make yourself as big and as intimidating as possible. You want to stand here, you want to stare at the coyote like he's staring at you. You want to clap your hands, you want to stand up straight, you want to make a lot of noise. Hopefully this will also encourage your dog to react because now you're you're angry, or you're being grouchy. So that make your dog a little bit irritated. The dog will start to bark. You're clapping your hands. The coyote is going to be, oh my God, it's too much for me to handle. Because again, they don't want conflict. He's going to run away. He's going to take off. So then once that's done, then you basically back away. Don't turn your back, don't run, and just walk away. And a coyote may, again, at a distance, watch you because they're very curious by nature, but they're not going to chase after you. Um, they're going to look at you. And again, if you feel you want to do it again, you would stop, turn, face the coyote, clap your hands, yell at it, throw a rock at him. Don't hit him. You don't want to harm him, but you do want to intimidate him. You scare him, and he'll go off because in the end, they're not looking at people or pets as a food source. What they're looking for is something easy, but they are very curious and that's what gets them into trouble. People call and they'll say that we have a coyote, something's wrong with it, it's on our property, it's staring at a stone wall or it's staring at our deck, it's just staring at it. We would respond, I've gone out and I see the coyote, I go over to it, I clap my hands, it runs away. I stop, I look at the stone wall and what do I see? A chipmunk or a mouse or something in the stone wall that's what the coyote was looking at. He's not rabid. He doesn't have rabies. He's not sick. He's just looking for food like anything else. Um, so when it comes to someone's property, the best way to do that is to make sure there's nothing on the person's property that would encourage coyotes to be there. So if you have a situation where you have a bird feeder, you want to make sure you clean up any kind of a mess, the shells that birds make a mess when they eat. If you have squirrels coming over, they're going to spread seeds all over the place. You want to do your very best to clean that up. If you have a shed, you want to make sure when they deliver, they have a lot of delivered sheds that they guess they get from Home Depot or Lowe's or other places where they show up, they put them in your backyard up on blocks that leaves a, a, a breezeway underneath it for ventilation for the shed. But that's a problem because that encourages animals like rabbits and woodchucks and squirrels and mice and other things to live under there, which are all attractants for coyotes. What you want to do for a shed you want to put some kind of a lattice up or something that blocks any kind of wildlife moving underneath there. And if you do find the wildlife underneath there, you do want to find a way to keep them out because if there's a food source that will attract not just coyotes, but other animals, which could also be trouble. So we've had a lot of problems in this past year or over the years with raccoons. People see a raccoon, they're not as intimidated about a raccoon as they do a coyote because the coyote is a little bit bigger and they, and they do stare at you. But we've had more problems 
or more people get more people being bitten or injured and more dogs being bitten or injured by raccoons than any other animal in Norway. Not the coyotes, not the black bear that comes in occasionally, not the bobcats that we do have bobcat in Norwalk. It's the raccoon that has caused the most trouble and raccoons are very obstinate. They will go into someone's home, they'll break a screen, they'll come in. We've had them walk into people's kitchens and you know, basically go right on the kitchen table and, and help themselves. So what if the person was put it out for food? Because they're very brave. The coyote, again, by nature, is a very skittish, shy animal that is curious, but it's not looking to harm anyone. People call and they would say that, you know, my dog was just attacked by a coyote. We had one recently a few weeks ago where someone had called. Um, they were at Flax Hill Park with their dog. The person at the park, now Flax Hill Park, there's no dogs allowed there. They were told not to go there anymore with the dog, but I guess they did go. They were there. Dog was off a leash. The dog ran off into the little woodland. He, I guess the dog came across a coyote, was chasing a coyote, and then the dog came running back to its owner because the coyote had a friend, and now he had two coyotes chasing the dog. When we spoke to the person, we basically told them that one, they should be at the park to begin with, but two, the fact that the dog shouldn't be out of control like that. We need to have control of the dog, and this way he wouldn't get himself in trouble. So with that, I would like to say that we do have coyote in Norwalk. Um, we've always had coyote in Norwalk. Um, you know, they are a very valuable, important part of our ecosystem. You know, without them, it, would, it wouldn't be as balanced as it is. They do serve a purpose. They do keep a lot of the animals that people, you know, have issues with, such, you know, damaging their, their lawns and stuff with rabbits or deer and such doing damage to their property. They also keep Canadian geese in check. They do take Canadian geese, which keeps the geese population in a natural balance, which is important. Otherwise, we'd have an abundance, well, we already have an abundance of, of Canadian geese, we'd have even more Canadian geese. So with that, I would like to say that, you know, the Eastern coyote is an animal that we do have. We can live with them, you know, safely and, and confidently. And they are something that we should have in our area and we do have. And that uh, I feel that, um, you know, as long as people take the proper precautions, that when they do come across them, that, that they, they haze them, they yell, they make noise, they make themselves look very big and, and, and imposing that the coyote uh, will, you know, stay away like they should and run away. And then again, I, I do tell people that if you are out and about for a walk, even downtown Norwalk or wherever, you always want to have your cell phone. And if you have an emergency, then you would simply call 911. They would forward a call to my office and then we would respond and address the issue if you do have an emergency from any wildlife, whether it be a coyote or a bear or, or a bobcat or anything else uh, that would be uh, possibly uh, harming or bothering someone. So that would be it. Thank you so much. That was actually very informative. Um, is there any questions, discussion from the committee? Ms. Johnson. Thanks, Chair. And thanks, Council Member Keegan, for this. And uh, Officer Sirico, I appreciate that so much. Um, the lack of education you know, when you find out, I mean, you just realize how little you didn't know. And so um, one question I did have, and this this goes to a, another point I've heard from some residents up kind of where I, I live, uh, Cranberry area, but also Broad River in there, a lot of dogs off leashes in neighborhoods and parks. And do you think just to be safe, people should be very much mi more mindful of keeping their dogs on leashes because of this? Or, or what are your recommendations for particularly dog owners about leash yeah. leashes? So the city of Norwalk, state of Connecticut, um, there are no leash requirements. You're not required to have your dog on a physical tether. With that said, um, we do have a lot of issues where we have dogs that people would say, they always listen to me no matter what happens. My dog always responds when I call it. And then when something does happen, it doesn't work out that way, unfortunately. And we've had a lot of people who call up and you know they'll say, you know, my dog was out. We were out for a walk. We took him off a leash, and you know he wandered off. And you know he was, uh, you know, he was either in the road and got struck, or he had a conflict with another dog that was also off a leash or on leash. So my recommendation to people is that you know unless you're in a fenced-in area, like Row Eight has a very nice fenced-in dog area. Uh, you know, that's something that's good. Um, I would always be very careful. Um, my personal dog, we have a little Jack Russell Terrier who, who does listen, but he is a Jack Russell and he's very headstrong. 
And we would, I would never let him off leash at an open area because of the fact that even though he does listen to me, being in his nature, being a Jack Russell Terrier, um, if he picked up on something like another animal, like a wild animal, he would be off like a shot and uh, it would be a problem. So my recommendation to everyone is that, you know, unless you're in a fenced in area that, that's contained um, and, and you've worked with your dog to train the dog and listen to you at all times um, as much as possible, um, my recommendation would be to have them on a leash. But then again, there's nothing that requires it. Um, we've had a lot of problems over the years where, you know, again, people, they'll walk their dog along a sidewalk on a busy street and off leash, you know, the dog is next to him at a heel, which is legal. It's not, you know, not being a problem, but then, you know, it takes one little motion to the left or to the right. and The dog steps off the curb onto the sidewalk, into the roadway, and then they have a problem. So, um, but back to coyotes, um, the thing with the coyote is that, you know, it is a very intelligent animal. And, and, and it's very curious by nature. And this is part of its problem. So if it sees a dog out, unless the owner's right with it, it's gonna run over to investigate because it wants to know what it is, what it's doing, why is it here? And it wants to feel it out to see what it's doing. And this is what happened because when a dog sees a coyote, a dog, most dogs, not all, most, their natural reaction to run over to it to see what it's doing. To. And then once that happens, you know, there's, there's, there's a problem, there's a melee. Um, I do tell people that, you know, even though we, we have full disclosure, we did have two smaller dogs um, taken in the last year or so in Norwalk by coyotes uh, that were seen and witnessed being taken. Uh, and another dog was bit. One of the two other dogs were found that were, that were, that were attacked by something. Um, the issue is that most of the time, and it is the owner's property, it is their property, but the coyotes don't realize this. And when the dog is out in the property by itself, unattended, um, it's a risk. And not just with coyotes, but with raccoons, and bobcat that we have in our we've had dogs get into melees or, spat or, or fights with deer, um, lots of issues. So when, when people take their dogs outside, even on their own property, it's important that they do go out with the dog, whether it's raining, whether it's late, you know, early in the morning, they need to go out properly supervised, treat the dog as if it was their child, keep an eye on it, keep it safe. And if they do happen to see anything in their yard, whether it be a deer or, or a rabbit or anything, you need to call the dog back and secure it and let the wildlife leave. And then, you know, they, the dog can go back out and, and do what it has to do. Even on your own property, it's important to respect wildlife because, you know, it is important to have it. And it's nice to have deer and other animals. And people do call my office quite often where they, 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 they have an incident between a dog and a woodchuck or a dog and something else. And I'm like, you know, you know, they are important to have wildlife and, you know, it is your property, but you should make some effort to at least coexist with your wildlife neighbors uh, in order just to do the right thing and be a, a, a positive and productive person and citizen. Marvelous. So, yes. I just wanted to say I'm really happy of the last point you said, um, coexisting with our natural friends, right? Um, yes. I, um, quick question. I, there's a question and a comment. The comment is, I think this would also be a great thing to add to our walkability, especially if you're a hug, you know, we've joked, um, especially Councilman Keegan being a tree hugger. If you're a tree hugger, holistic community, our, our nature, our natural friends are part of that. So in those walkability things of educating not only what's growing around here, what's living around here too, would probably be good with this whole wanting to make it more walk friendly, right? So I was just, I thought that would also be a great add. And then secondly, your input, especially with the dogs, particularly within my area, I'm a dog lover, I'm a nature lover, I'm a nature lover, period. But um, the increase of dogs, especially small dogs in our area has gone up. And this is also a great, you know, a great point in reference when I have people who call me and say, well, why can't we bring our dogs to parks? You know what I mean? This is a great point of con um, point of reference to bring up, especially with the coexisting and what a small animal can bring, right? But my concern is there's a lot of dogs I've actually seen now. I've seen four small dogs just running and not secured, and we had to find the owner or this and that. How does those type of 
situations coming in attract animals that are, aren't usually like, let's say, in a downtown area or then that's because our dog population has increased? Yes. Uh, so with, with COVID, uh, we've had a, a large uptick in smaller size dogs. Smaller size dogs are very convenient. They're small. You can put them into a smaller space. They're easy to clean up after. They're, they don't eat as much. Um, a lot of the new ones, these new designer breeds, I guess you would call them, they're really not a breed, but they're just a, a, a mutt, but they, they're yeah. a designer yeah, breed. Hybrid. Mutt. Yeah, hybrid. Yeah. small fortune. Um, you know, people dress them up, they shave them, they do different kind of artsy kind of stuff with them to do their nails. Um, and what we're having is a, is a big uptick with a lot of these smaller dogs. I mean, you know, for, for many years you had like, you know, you had your larger dogs and some small dogs, but a lot mostly were larger dogs. Well, and like now wolves. we much more, <laughs> much more, what's that? They were more yeah. like wolves. So they were competition, right? But now we got all these yeah. little guys. Little dogs. So, so you have situations where, you know, people, again, they let their dogs off leash, uh, you know, at the parks. They, we, we, we've had a lot of cases where, you know, people go to the park and I, I've, I've picked up dogs. I've picked up dogs from like, you know, Taylor Farm or et cetera, or Cranberry Park. And, you know, I'll wait five or 10 minutes, someone will call and they'll say that we had found a stray dog and I'll show up and I'll pick it up. And then I'll wait a few moments, five, 10 minutes at the end, you know, at the location and hoping someone will come looking for it. And then they don't. So then I leave, I take the dog with me back to the pound and I get a phone call like an hour later saying that someone had stolen their dog. And I would right. say, I know exactly who sold the dog. That would be me because they were stray <laughs> running around about an hour ago where you've been. So, you know, so at the end of the day, again, you know, it's a very important for people to understand that we do have to share our environment, you know, with each other and wildlife and nature. And it is important to be a responsible person and, you know, and, and not allow your, your dog, large or small, to wander off without your knowledge and not go looking for it, you know, for quite a long period of time. Because, and even in a short period of time, you know, something could happen. And the longer the time span goes, the more opportunities for something to happen, which is, which is not, you know, not what you want. So, you know, to answer your question is that, you know, we do have wildlife, you know, does the, the smaller dog bring in the, the wildlife? I would say no, but we do, we have had a major uptick in smaller dogs, especially with all the, with the, the condos, the apartment complexes that are being built in Norwalk uh, all over the place. You know, these units are smaller, you know, one, two bedroom and people are, it's much easier to, to bring in a smaller dog that's five, 10 pounds than a larger, you know, 50, 60 pound dog into those units. So that's also part of the reason that, uh, that we've had an uptick in that's a smaller breeds. And just, just with those, the bear is 211. And just last question with the uptick, would their, um, their uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like their scent, meaning um, urine or feces. Mm -hmm. Sure. In that uptick, would that mm -hmm. also be any like attraction? I would say, I would say it's not, but what is an attraction is that people, they, 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 go, they do go to parks or other places and then humans by nature, um, for whatever reason, a lot of people, they discard stuff. So you go someplace, you bring in food, you bring in a beverage. When you're through with it, you tend to throw it away into the garbage can, which is left at the park for a reason to put your garbage in. The issue is that the, the garbage goes in there and then that does, the garbage does attract, does attract wildlife to the garbage can in the, in the park. So what I try to do myself is that when we go someplace, whatever we bring to the park, you know, food or beverages, when we're through with that particular item, whatever packaging it came in, we bring it with us, we leave with it. We bring it back, we put it into the car and we take it home and then we throw it away at our home. We don't throw it away at the park because this way it's, it's not at the park and it won't attract. So dog going to the bathroom won't attract wildlife, but people well, leaving us, stuff behind, gotcha. leaving, you know, waste material, packaging, wrappers, cups, whatever they be, will attract wildlife. It's not coyote, it'll attract mice and other things, which are the coyotes prey, and that does bring them in, yes. Understood, thank you so much. You're very well. It. Sure. But if I just may, uh, yes. Nick, add that we, we intend, uh, members of the committee, we intend to follow up on this, um, ask Animal Control to help us uh, provide 
uh, a handout so that when um, residents come at uh, dog license time, that they get a little handout prepared by uh, uh, Bob if, if he helps us and, and um, given out by the town clerk's office. Rick McQuaid has already agreed to be involved in it. So uh, I think this is a good thing and I, th I think it'll be good for our residents. Thank you, uh, Chairman Saccinelli, for uh, allowing us the time for this. Yeah, I think it was a great, uh, great topic and a great discussion. Um, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, was there any final questions? I, I, I actually did have one, one brief question. Um, it, it sounds like coyotes by and large aren't something that we should be too concerned with. Um, but is there any telltale signs that there might be something wrong with a coyote that we should actually avoid? Or is there anything that we should um, look out for of course. in general? So, yes, of course. So when you are dealing with any wild, whether it be a coyote, a black bear, or a woodchuck, anything of that nature, anything that's wildlife, the normal behavior is for the animal to have some standoffishness where, you know, there is some uh, a comfort zone that the animal will run away. Um, if you have an animal that is unkempt looking, so you look at that animal and its face is all crusted over or if it has flies on it, or if, if it has an awful smell, like a rotting smell, something to indicate the animal is injured, then, then you would want to call the Norwalk Animal Control Dog Police Department and to report it and we would look into it to see indeed what's going on. Um, and, that, and that's to include any, any animal whatsoever, not just coyotes. Um, you know, so... You know, when it, when it comes to coyotes in particular, you know, uh, again, you know, if, if you feel threatened by them, if someone, you know, feels that they're very, that the coyote may have, may be ill or sick, um, you, they would call the Norwalk Animal Patrol, Norwalk Police Department. Uh, we would look into it, you know, come out, take a look, see what they look like. Maybe send us a photograph to see what they look like. Um, but for the most part, if, if you look at them, if they look fairly clean, fairly kept, their, their, their coat is normal. Um, that's an indication they're fine. You know, people do call about wildlife and they'll say, you know, like, again, like the coyote staring at the wall or something, but there's a reason he's doing it. There's always a reason they're doing what they're doing. Um, you know, if you find one that that's limp, they can't get up, then obviously we would respond, you know, for humane reasons to see what we can do about it. Um, but when it comes to wildlife, regardless of what it is, if a, a citizen has a concern, they would simply call the office and uh, let, you know, advise us of other concerns and we would look into it. The other day, uh, we had a citizen in our wall call. Uh, they thought they had some kind of a giant snake in their yard. So uh, one of my officers, Officer Fellner went out and uh, it turned out it was a black rat snake, which for this area was a large one with about a five and a half foot of long, long snake that is indigenous to this location and he, recognized it. He sent me a photo and I agreed that's what it was, a black rat snake. And there they live here and it was healthy and and it went on its way. He explained to the homeowner, you know, what it was and it was it was not venomous. And it is nice to have, it's important to have in part of our ecosystem. Um, but we did check it out, just be safe that it wasn't someone's wayward python, ball python, reticulated python, and it got loose. Uh, but it was indeed a an indigenous uh, you know snake that does live in Connecticut. And and part of our ecosystem. So we do respond to concerns, uh, whatever they may be. Uh, we try to educate the public to explain to them, you know, ways of, of coexisting with wildlife, no matter what it is. And that if people do have a concern, uh, we are here um, to assist and to give advice and to intervene uh, if necessary. No, that's fantastic, thank you. So and, and it sounds like in general, you know, live, live and let live, but when in doubt, give, give you a call. Oh, it's never a problem. People call it all kinds of concerns, you know. Some are, are comical, you know, which which you'd explain to them over the phone. I go, oh, you know, it's I I get it. You know, okay, that's why he's there. But um, you know, if they have a concern, you know, this is what we're here for for public safety reasons, and we want to make sure everyone's comfortable and safe. And a lot of it, I would say that it is education. Um, you know, especially with with people moving into Norwalk, you know, with all the new development, uh, there are people who are coming into the area that aren't familiar with our local habitat or local animals that we have. And, uh, you know, it's the first time, um, you know, they, they've ever seen one up close and they don't know how to react. So they call and we give them advice, explain to them that, you know, this is what it is and everything is fine. Um, myself, I was in Maine two weeks ago and my first time in my life, I, I came across a moose and it was probably maybe 40 feet away from me and the thing was bigger than a horse. 
and I've never seen a moose up that close before, and I was quite impressed. I wasn't afraid of it. It was fine, but when I, I saw it, I was like, that is a very impressive animal because of its size. Well, thank you. Oh, Ms. Revolus. Yeah. Last question. Yes, you course. know how there's like the DARE program, right? Yeah. Does animal control have anything that they do like in, or can there be not only just these pamphlets, but like, I think this should be something we're like educating even in our younger, just to know who's indigenous or animals that are indigenous to this area. Like, has that ever been a thought? Because even hearing you, I'm like, I would have loved that, learning that um, in that yes. way. Do we have anything like that with your um, division, um, with the in animal the control? Sure. In the past, we've had uh, opportunities to speak to this. We've gone to schools. I've gone to schools before in the past. Uh, we've gone, we've done little uh, Q and A's uh, with the post office for safety regarding dogs and delivering packages to people's homes. So it's something that uh, we have done in the past and I'd be open to doing now to do like a, you know, little, uh, I guess, show and tell or educational programs for, for, for you know, for school children or, or any organization uh, that be interested in uh, having someone of either myself or Officer Felner, uh, Felner speak. I would love to see like our maritime or even maybe like our museums or something or whatever maybe connect our schools like I think that would be a great and engaging way you for youth and um, parents to do it with their kids you know I I think that would be amazing actually sure it is always good to especially with children when they're so impressionable and so young to to get to them early to explain to them the importance of, of nature and so that they as they grow up, you know, they, they see animals and they, they really are interested in it. It's a good subject to pursue. Um, you know, I know when I was a child, when I was young, that was a big thing for me. A part of the reason I'm in this line of, of, of work, uh, it's something that work for me. Um, it's something that I have, do have an interest in. I think it is an important part of, of, of humanity and, and for our children's education to be exposed to and to, to understand uh, their surroundings and, and what, what they have, the opportunities that they do have uh, just in their own backyard that they probably aren't even aware of. So yes, that's something we would be interested in doing, of course. Oh, I, I, have, I agree. I would love to see that happen. If I could help with that, I would love to see that happen. Thank All you right. for your uh, time. <laughs> Yeah, Robert, that was that was fantastic. I actually learned a lot more than I was expecting to. This was an interesting topic, and you brought a, a lot of good information. Um, I I guess it's one of those things that you just don't know what you don't know, and you draw assumptions based on I don't know what. But I I definitely learned a lot this evening. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. All right, moving on to the uh, the old business. We'll go through the. Uh, th there's been some time since our last meeting, so. Um, as brief or as long as you would like to take it, but um, we'll, we'll go start with the police update. Chief, how are you, sir? Good. Uh, good evening. I just first thing I want to say is we're extremely fortunate to have Bob. Um, he's, a, he's as you see, he's a professional. He knows his job, yeah. but he just doesn't know his job. He does his job. I send him a lot of emails and uh, calls from residents about different topics and he never says no. He always just jumps on it. He does things that are outside of his scope. And uh, so I just want to congratulate him on a great job always. And he was our assistant uh, dog warden, assistant ACO for many years. And then when uh, our ACO retired, uh, Bob applied for the job and we were more than happy that he, you know, he got it. And we're also fortunate that our assistant uh, animal control was a part-time animal control in Fairfield and moved over here. So we have two very experienced people and uh, nobody better. So again, I just want to say, Bob, thank you and uh, continue the good work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Chief, on the, um, did, were there any police updates that you wanted to go over or um, from the standard discussion items? I, I don't think I had any questions prepared uh, from the, I didn't receive any questions from the committee uh, in advance of this meeting, but if uh, we could, we could open it up to just standard questions from police update or uh, chief, if you had any updates uh, over the past couple months, the last time that we met was June. So I'm sure some stuff has happened since then uh, that you wanted to touch on briefly. 
One thing I, I, I will touch on, and I was going to speak to this at the Board of Ed meeting the other night. Unfortunately, it was canceled because of the, uh, yeah. the untimely death of one of the board members, which was a very sad thing that happened just before the, the meeting took place. But there's been a lot of talk uh, on social media and things about the school resource officers and uh, the funding and what's happening with that. And I just want to point out and just reassure everyone that myself, the school district, the mayor, um, we're all committed to the school resource officer program. Uh, the funding hasn't changed. <laughs> Everything's in place. Uh, the one issue we've been dealing with is staffing shortages right now. We've had a lot, we've had several officers leave the department uh, with retirements and resignations for a variety of reasons. And uh, we have a number of officers on uh, extended sick leave workers comp, um, including uh, two of the resource officers. So because of that, uh, we're a little short staffed in the schools, but we're compensating for that. And on a temporary basis, we've made adjustments and the school district's been great uh, hiring additional officers for security and other things. So uh, we're dealing with it. And once we get our staffing uh, back up, uh, it takes some time because it's hard to hire and, and get people back on the street in a quick manner. Um, but we're working on that. And as soon as we can get people back from workers comp and people back, um, you know, hired and back on the street, we'll get the, we'll get full coverage there. We've trained a number of uh, new school resource officers as well as backup. So um, I'm hopeful that in the near future, we'll have that back to full capacity and, and back. But um, unfortunately, as you know, social media takes a life of its own. And uh, for whatever reason, people start posting things that are totally, uh, totally false, but uh, we have to deal with the ramifications of that. So I, I'll just point that out. But other than that, uh, things have been going pretty well. Uh, on the COVID front, uh, it's pretty much back to normal uh, as far as the department's concerned. We have, I don't think right now we have no one out with COVID. We've had very little issues with that. Um, our call volume has increased a little bit. It's still down quite a bit from what it was pre-COVID back in 2019. I can't believe it's been a year and a half already, but uh, 2019, our, if you compare the numbers, our volume is down considerably uh, since then. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, aside from the staffing issues, things have been pretty, going pretty well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rebelus. But, and, okay. Um, I just wanted to say, my only question was going to be with the resource uh, officers. So thank you for just opening that up. Um, I just wanted to give a special shout out to all of the resource officers that we do have working, but in particular, Officer Cornell. Um, he does an amazing job um, for Roten and Brian McMahon. Um, I just wanted to ask another question about engagement. So I still stop uh, police officers in their car at the bus stop um, just to say, hey, why are you in your car? So um, I'm just wondering how is it looking with engagement and you know the ropes with that? I know you guys are pressed, like obviously with um, the lack of officers, but just wondering how um, police engagement with the community has went or even with that virtual um, program that you said you guys would have um, with us seeing what an officer goes through. I was, what is the playback of having the officer see how we would feel towards officers? Just, just that engagement. I was wondering how was it going? Yeah, I'm not sure about the virtual thing. I think I can't remember the, it. I can't remember it. Completely. I think you might be talking about the use of force simulator, maybe. I think so. I think so. I think yeah. so. So, yeah, I think so that's been installed. We have that in the police department. It's been installed and we've had our officers trained as instructors, uh, which took a little time, but we're now just starting to roll that out and have the training on that, uh, not the training, but the actual training of officers on that system. And our plan is to invite whoever, you know, the council people or, um, and also our citizen police Academy, which will start in uh, October to experience that and take part in that. So, I would expect that within the next month or so, uh, you'll get an invite from uh, from me or my deputies to uh, an evening uh, trial, so to speak, to kind of see what it's about and how what we're using it for and what it does and 
that kind of thing. It's kind of amazing. You'll you'd be surprised at what what it'll do. So as far as that goes, I would I would say within the next month or so, uh, you should be a, have an opportunity to give that a try. Um, and then as far as engagement overall, uh, we've been doing a lot of things. We had our backpack giveaway um, last month, well, last you know, two or three weeks ago, along with uh, Reverend Kosimis and the World Alive Bible Church and gave away almost 600 backpacks there. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Night Out we had in uh, last month in August that was a amazing. real a huge success. We had yeah, hundreds amazing. of people that came. Um, Kind of surprising because it was we weren't sure if we were going to have it with covid and the restrictions and so we didn't plan it early on but when we got to go the go ahead to you know to do it um uh, our officers in a community policing unit really stepped up and brought it brought together community organizations along with a number of restaurants and uh it's a beautiful we had a lot of food and you know variety of kids uh, kids programs a magician the bounce house the a lot of things. So um, things are starting as COVID hopefully is looking better and better. Um, we'll start getting more and more personal contact instead of um, virtual <laughs> contact. And as far as Cornell is concerned, yeah, I get I get so many letters and emails mm -hmm. and things about his work with the community and with the school resource officer position that he's in. He's a perfect fit. He loves it. And uh he, he, you know, he's a tremendous asset for us. So we're, we're glad to have him. Yeah, I just want, you know, and I appreciate it because, you know, we um, overall, there, there could be back and forth, right? But there are some good people in there. And I just would love to see those personalities shine out, you know, and we have them. We do. Cornell, um, who passed from mayors, you, they're there. Um, but you always have to go a little bit in, internally to get to you. And I would just like to, those personalities to showcase more upfront because we do really have some great personalities that care, you know, I just would love to see it, you know, showcase. So it doesn't, that can go on the social media <laughs> instead, you know. Any other questions for the chief? Chief, thank you again for your time. And as always, we appreciate you and I, I think it was good that you were able to set the record straight here as well um, for the uh, for the um, uh, officers at the, at the schools because I did see that circulating. So thank you for addressing that. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that it was it's it was it's so late for you guys to come on for these discussion items, but we appreciate it. Uh, well, maybe... I, I I gotta say one thing. I gotta thank thank Diana because she's taken over control of the health welfare public safety or or health public safety committee. So now we're not last. Now she put herself last and she put us first. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I get rewarded for being nice. You know, several months ago. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But uh, no, and we appreciate it. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up as well. We we do appreciate all that you did when you were uh, liaising and, and running the committee for us. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks. Have a good night. Have a good night, sir. Chief Gatto, how are you? Fine, sir. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. You're up, sir. Interesting, interesting meeting tonight. <laughs> a little different. A little different. Sorry. I apologize to you as well for uh, keeping you up so late. All right, Michelle's after me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just have some boring, uh, boring fire statistics. Um, I only brought the month of August with me today. Okay. So uh, I'll try to make this pretty painless. Um, <clears throat> 717 calls for the month of August, which averages out to 23.1 per day. So it includes uh, 11 different types of fires, 58 different types of rescues, 380 EMS calls, um, 29 hazardous conditions, which are gas leaks, electrical carbon monoxide, uh, 32 public assist calls, 50 good intent or smoke scares, 154 different types of alarms. Um, so between 2020 and 2021, we're actually 351 incidents more, and we are 772 runs more than we were uh, last year. Just quickly, August 9th, we had a truck fire on Crescent Street um, inside one of the city carting trailers. 
We had a garage fire on Silent Grove Court, August 14th. We had a heavy equipment fire of a piece of apparatus on Chestnut Street, August 15th. And August 24th, a car fire on Main Street, uh, Mercedes E500 fully involved engine compartment. The fire marshal's office, they did 140 inspections last month. They sent out 93 notifications, one public education event. They did 40 plan reviews, eight liquor license inspections, eight fire investigations. And they brought in uh, $2,420 um, revenue. The COVID, um, we've experienced the, the most cases of COVID in the month of August. Uh, we have seven positive cases. Uh, luckily, everybody has returned to work. So that's behind us now. And we have no, nobody out now as far as COVID related. The recruitment that we've been doing is uh, we're just, we have finished our first group of interviews. Uh, we've given 12 conditional offers of employment. Uh, everybody accepted and we're starting orientation for six days on September 30th. And then they'll go on their first shift uh, starting October 9th. And then they, by the end of October, we'll be interviewing for the next February uh, Fire Academy class. And just one thing I wanna mention that Assistant Chief Bassett, you may or may not know, um, is retiring from the fire department after uh, with the city for 29 years. Uh, his last date is effectively uh, October 2nd. He'll be retiring. Questions? Well, uh, for, I wasn't, thank you for that. I was not aware that um, Assistant Chief Bassett was retiring, so we'll have to reach out to him and thank him for all that he has done. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the rest of the committee? Um, just uh, any, just because we did touch on it the last time that we met, we in, in June we were discussing the fireworks and, and things related to fireworks. And hey, was there anything outside of the outside of the norm this year? I feel like they're just anecdotally. I feel like there was fewer uh, incidents from from the Fourth of July and fireworks. Is that fair? Yeah, we did not have any incidents related to fireworks this Fantastic. year. Fantastic. No. All right. Uh, any other questions from the group? All right, Chief, thank, thank you again, as always. It's great seeing you. I appreciate Welcome. the update. Thank you. Have, thank you. have a good evening, sir. You too. Mr. Luca. Great, thank you. Um, so I think since the last meeting, we've had a bit of weather. Um, we had Elsa, Henri was a bit of a dud, and then Ida a few weeks ago. Um, Ida probably caused the most residential damage. Um, so I have sent a couple updates to our emergency management team. Um, basically we did a damage assessment of residents uh, through an online portal that we had. Uh, we did send everything to the state of Connecticut um, to the Division of Emergency Management Homeland Security, which I call my mothership. Um, because that's the group that kind of oversees um, all things emergency management for us. So they received it. Um, we did meet the thresholds for um, municipal damages and costs, as well as residential damages for the county and for the state. So the next step will actually be to do a joint damage assessment with FEMA to see if we're able to get any assistance for residents. Um, and for the most part, um, FEMA assistance is divided into two categories. Um, the municipal side, which is called public assistance and the assistance for homeowners, which is IA, um, individual assistance. Um, so again, we are hopeful that some assistance will be able to be provided, um, cautiously optimistic, um, if for any reason FEMA denies it, 
the state could either appeal or sometimes small business administration will make uh, low interest loans available for homeowners. So right now it's a bit of a waiting game. Um, I have been in regular communication with the folks that did send in their damage reports and we've also tried to put some information up on the website and social media to let folks know what's happening. Um, as opposed to New York and New Jersey, Louisiana, um, where the damage is so visible and, and obvious. The Connecticut, we were impacted, but it wasn't quite on the same scale. So again, we do have to go through the process of um, data collection. And again, this is kind of normal for, for FEMA. Uh, so we are, up again, cautiously optimistic that some of the residents that were impacted from ELSA might be able to get some assistance from Ida. Um, and then also coordinating with conservation and public works um, to discuss some of the issues at McKendry Court, because a few of those homeowners have asked about mitigation, possible buyouts for or acquisition um, for their property. I think it's like three homes on the end. Um, so one, two, and six. So we are looking to see, again, if that might be an option, if there's an appetite to do that, and then what the next steps would be. Um, so again, we're kind of exploring everything and then also working with, uh, I can't think of the acronym, it's USDA, and there's something else, um, another four letters, but to do some conservation on the, the brook itself um, for the long term. So again, we are kind of monitoring uh, the damage, again, working with some other departments to see what long-term solutions there might be. Um, I know Public Works has some solutions for some of the other areas and they can um, work on those. And then kind of keeping an eye on the Atlantic and what may come. Uh, the, the hurricane season runs through November 30th. So we're a little bit past the peak of the season. So I'm sure there'll be more to come on all things weather. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Ms. Shanahan. Um, Michelle, can you tell me more about the McKendry situation? Because that is in my district and we've been concerned about that for a long time. That has been really troublesome for the neighbors there. Um, and it might not be that we should be doing it online now and taking everybody else's time. Um, maybe Tom Livingston and I can meet up with you and understand better some of the issues that are happening over there. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. And like I said, I think they are, uh, again, we've not, uh, we've had some initial conversations. I stopped down the other day to kind of walk through the area because um, it has been a while. And just to see again, if there's any changes with some FEMA programs that might be newer, especially again, given the climate change issues. Um, again, more things seem to be opening up, opening up. So again, just to have some conversations, nothing committed, but again, really see what we can explore to see if we can get some, get them any kind of assistance. And Michelle, answer. and just one last question, not to um, belabor this point, but so the, um, you know, the, the bridge washed out above them on uh, Rewaiten Avenue over there is part of the situation exacerbated by that? Is that making things worse for McKendry Court? It doesn't seem like it. Um, again, I know the Public Works engineering folks have looked into it. Um, again, I, I know with Ida, there was just so much rain in such a short time. Um, again, Elsa to the same degree. Um, so part of it is, you know, is this just like a natural like, narrowing of the, the river? Um, again, the, the speed of the water, the, the height, um, you know, is, did everything just compound for that storm and make it that much worse? Or again, my, my worry with all things climate is, you know, this, we're gonna see these events more often with the severity. And again, I think being able to have the conversation with them of, you know, it's, you know, wh what are they looking for? You know, what is, what some of the options might be that weren't there years ago um, that we can explore with them. But again, those are super nice residents. Um, yeah. And like I said, it's see what we can do for them. Okay, great. So I think if you don't mind, Tom and I will circle back with you and get a little bit more information. Perfect, sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you, all. have a great night.
Uh, Michelle, Michelle, quick question yeah. before you hop off. Um, are you still soliciting uh, information from residents that were impacted by the storms, or is it is it useful to pass those cases along to you, or is it are we did we pass a date? Yeah, um, for the most part, it's we passed a date. We were just trying to do an initial assessment to see if we hit that first threshold. Um, the next thing is a few years ago, Public Works and us. Um, split the costs because I'm cheap on everything and I like to split uh, share costs with that when I can. Um, so for, it's for a program called Crisis Tracks. So Public Works uses it a lot for their equipment staffing um, and again, tracking of a lot of their more detailed costs. And again, on my, ben my benefit is the residential portal. So pretty much as soon as we knew the extent of IDA um, based on the calls and again, what we were seeing, I was able to turn that portal on even before the state actually asked us to do damage assessments. So we probably had a little more than an extra week to collect that data. Um, and that's just, again, a fantastic resource that we have. Once the, once the portal is closed, um, again, we submit the numbers and then you know, FEMA kind of looks at it from there. Um, only if they said, you know, you guys are kind of on the threshold try to get more data, then we might open it back up again and resolicit. But again, we seem to kind of be where we needed to be um, as a county and then as a state, because they're looking only for homes that are either destroyed or have major damage um, right. per the, the FEMA guidelines. So we're in pretty good shape. Uh, Ms. Shannon. Just to follow up again on another um, section of my constituency, because when um, I've been out walking a lot and I noticed that um, Deepwood Lane and Knollwood also had a lot of damage. We, were, um, we had a lot of um, reports about that today. Is that, um, are a lot of those houses on your radar screen or should we bring those to your attention? I, let me go back to the list. I think I may have had one or two for Deepwood, I don't believe. I had any for no wood, but I can double check. Okay, that'd be great. And another place that we saw really extensive damage when we were out walking was Geneva Street. Okay, that I don't think we had any. Um, and, and what we'll do is once we get some more information from the FEMA side, so what they do now is kind of look at some of the, um, they do it all virtually, which still seems a little bit odd to me, but, um, so they'll look at the photos, videos that were submitted. Um, we'll do that for, again, the major and the, any destroyed in the, the area. So they may not ask us anything, but they may go to another town that was harder hit. Um, and then once we get a, a more definitive answer, then we would say to all the residents, and we really would do a push um, and work with all of you as common council to make sure you're getting information to your residents that Yes, FEMA assistance is available. Here's how to um, get a, um, a FEMA number. Here's the next steps and work on that education as well. That'd be so helpful because we really have, I probably have 15 people that I've spoken to in the last two weeks that were really badly hurt. So thank you so much for that. As soon as you have it, it'd be helpful. Perfect. And one thing I am working on with our, with the emergency management team is we're gonna do a FEMA kind of 101 refresher training on Wednesday. Um, so I, what I can also do is maybe just do a one page fact sheet or um, something to that effect for all of you as a common council, just so you also have that better understanding of the process. I think when you do it a lot, it's just, it, it's so familiar, but you, I, I tend to forget that again, it's, we've gone a while without a big disaster declaration. So I can do a little refresher or send that at the PowerPoint. Um, to all of you as well. It's fantastic, thank you. Uh, Ms. Revolus. So this might be a question a little over. I just, I've been wondering this so much. I get weather, but how much is land displacement causing other places to flood? Like for example, we're building and we're building and developing in areas that I used to see flood normally or have damages that I'm not seeing happen anymore. But then because of that, other places that I didn't see it happen before, it's happening. 
So it makes me wonder with development, how much of our earth displacement causes these um, situations to be exacerbated by natural disasters? Or that effects. is, yeah, it's a really good question. And, and part of what we also look at is um, just, if you think about the land as a sponge, when we are seeing a lot of these, um, what might've been, and I, I think of really, you know, a very small little bungalow on um, a parcel that gets sold and you know, a larger, what I would call it, almost like a McMansion, goes up taking up like 95% of that same parcel, you do lose some of that sponge. Um, right. So I think it, it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, again, we are just seeing, I think naturally, a lot of these storms are slowing down. They're just dumping unprecedented amount of ra um, amounts of rain um, on the area. So I think it's just a lot of factors. And really, again, it's just- And, and don't the, kill me. Don't kill oh, me no. saying this. And no, and I know guys, Lisa, guys don't kill me. Rowayton is South Norwalk. So if you're developing in South Norwalk and it's causing issues in Rowayton, we're not gonna think about that. It's the most Southern part of Norwalk. And you see it in other areas here. And like, so I'm just wondering, especially like we all are Norwalk. So if you build here, mm -hmm. how does it affect here? You know what I mean? Like if if I'm seeing you are flooding here more, but I'm not seeing water on Water Street anymore at all. What's going on? You know what I mean? If I'm seeing other pockets, like literally, um, I I don't, I'm forgetting the intersection. Um, but I was so surprised how underwater this four-way intersection was. And I just I I know it's downhill, but I just never realized how deep it was till now. And again, there's places that aren't normally flooding that is notorious for its flooding. And I'm just wondering how that displacement in developing is causing other areas to have problems because the whole place and this whole space is a sponge. So yeah. um, I'm just wondering. And I can, I can, Reach, I, 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 I respect all of the time because um, yeah, it is such a bigger issue um, yeah, that again maybe we can have some conversations with public works as well because then we didn't really see as much of an issue on Water Street with Ida whereas with Elsa it, it was again it, it was Water Street um, right. so again it is some of the variation of you know also where the band the rain bands are coming where they're sitting um and it's just, again, our neighboring communities had even higher amounts of rain. And then, you know, two towns up, um, it, it was much less significant. So it, it is, again, I think a, a matter of the system, but then also, again, we're, we're just seeing, again, an event like that where it's just, there is no way for the drainage system or wastewater treatment, um, the overall system, just to be able to keep up with that. And again, what changes have to be made um, but again, it, it is, I mean, it, it, it's a holistic approach. It's like mm -hmm. things do impact each other. Um, mm -hmm. But I can, I can try to find a, a, get a better explanation kind of maybe with public works, um, have one of the engineers come and probably explain a little bit better or, or with conservation. Um, Cause again, it is, I mean, it's a fascinating conversation, um, but again, I, I know it's, it is late right now as well. Sorry for throwing that at you. Thank you so much for dealing with <laughs> <No>. that. <laughs> Michelle, thank you. Thank you again for the report. I mean, I, I, you know me personally. I find all of the uh, all of the weather related uh, topics very very interesting, and the response to it. And um, you you are awesome, and we appreciate you. So thank you for all that you do, and thank you for joining us tonight. Great. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night. And last up. How are you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all good, all good. All great stuff tonight. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll give a quick health department update and then Brian Weeks is on our epidemiologist. He can, and since it's been a couple of months since we've gotten a COVID update, he can let you know where we are with cases. Um, so 
Flu season is coming up, and so I just wanted to highlight some of the flu clinics that we have going on. We're going to have one on uh, uh, Tuesday, October 5th at Brian McMahon High School from 5 to 7 p.m., and then we're also going to have one at the Norwalk Senior Center at, on Thursday, October 7th from 11 to 1 p.m. We are asking for people to make appointments, and we have information on our website if you go um, to our website, norwalkct.org backslash flu, you can find more information about making an appointment. Um, after we have those community clinics, we are going to have weekly uh, scheduled times where people can make appointments as well to get uh, their flu shot throughout the season. Um, for COVID-19 vaccination, um, next Wednesday is going to be our last clinic at the Maritime Center from 5 to 7 p.m. and we'll be offering Moderna and Pfizer. And following that, we'll be offering second dose appointments for those who came for their first dose with us um, at the health department. So they'll be able to make an appointment with us. Um, there will be continuing um, clinics out in the community through, um, you know, October with uh, CHC Inc. So we'll be um, sharing more information about that, you know, in the mayor's briefings, we'll go through the city's social media. So keep people up to date. Um, we had a lot of uh, success this summer um, with our vaccine equity partnership funding. Um, Many of you have heard, heard about that before, but with our partners, we had this, we had money from the state to fund Norwalk Community Health Center, Community Health Center, Inc., um, and the Family and Children's Agency for the vaccine equity work. So over the summer, we held more than 100 mobile clinics. We administered collectively, you know, as a partnership, more than 4,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine. And we also um, approximately administered 130 at-home vaccinations. Uh, in terms of contact tracing, because of the cases went up this summer, we had to look at our staffing and sort of reallocate and figure out how we we're going to manage, you know, the increase in cases. So I want to really thank uh, Trace Argandesi, our Assistant Director of Health for Community Health, Brian Weeks, our epidemiologist, and Darlene Hoffler, our Supervisor of Clinical Services. They worked with all the staff to figure out um, how to manage that internally. Um, we've, we've had about like 10 staff members of our own staff, as well as for from the Family and Children's Agency supporting contact tracing. Um, so they've been doing such a great job. Uh, over the summer, you might remember some of the state testing sites had closed at the end of June. And so my staff did some research on, you know, what is the testing availability out in the community? What are the barriers? What do we need to do? So we worked very closely with the mayor's office and Senator Duff and others to, you know, advocate for more additional resources for testing within Norwalk. And now, you know, there are, we are back at Rowan Middle School. We have Semaphore is there to do testing five days a week. So that was a really great partnership with the state and others to, to bring back testing um, to Norwalk. We're busy right now finalizing some of our reaccreditation documentation just, um, I think everyone is aware that we're an accredited health department and we had to put a pause on some of that, um, the reaccreditation during COVID, but we're getting back to just finalizing some of that work. And uh, those are the big highlights of what's going on. And I'm gonna just turn it to Brian just to give the surveillance update. Thanks, Brian. Sure, and, and thank you, Deanna. Uh, so hi everybody, Brian Weeks, epidemiologist at the Norwalk Health Department. Let me just share a screen. Yes, and it came up perfect. Um, so what should be popping up on your screen, I'm gonna do very kind of quick quick overview just because I know it's later in the day um, in terms of it's 9.09 p.m. right now. So um, jumping right into it uh, in terms of COVID, this is the CDC county community levels of transmission for the last seven days. This has kind of been the reference source, the data reference source for determining like face mask usage as well as where the level of activity is for COVID relative to each county. And so as you can see for a majority of counties uh, inside the United States, they still are in the red high, which is the highest category. Um, and if you look at it more specifically uh, for the state of Connecticut, you can see how still seven out of the eight counties are in the red, including Fairfield County. Uh, Middlesex County is the only one that's in the orange, which is a substantial or second highest category. So overall you have about um, almost like 77% per, uh, of the counties in the United States that are in you know, the high or substantial categories. Um, and so just kind of moving forward, what's been driving that? And, you know, again, this is also kind of contending with the fact that we haven't met for a couple of months. Um, you know, Delta has been driving that activity as we're all well aware uh, in terms of the news coverage and everything else. In prior meetings, we have discussed this. Uh, and you can see how Delta kind of predominantly with, uh, you know, one of the uh, substrains, you know, B16172, 
Um, you know, the orange here is Delta, and you see it's been really kind of running the show when you look at the surveillance data, uh, you know, by week to week. Um, and, you know, pretty much, you know, when you add it all together, it's 98.6% uh, of all cases that are presenting, um, you know, in the United States from September 12th to the 18th, based upon the forecasting model the CDC does. Uh, and this is for variants of concern and variants of interest. Um, and so it's just really important to keep that in mind uh, that Delta is running the show. And you can see here from the regional perspective uh, for the country that uh, the orange and the pie charts indicating Delta as well. Again, and this also further solidified with the state health department surveillance uh, for variants of concern that are circulating. And uh, Delta, as you can guess, is in the red here, really running that show and almost, you know, 100 percent, 99 percent of specimens collected by the state health department and alpha variant, which we were familiar with before from the UK uh, in the black here, but it got very much and very quickly uh, outrun by Delta's much higher transmissibility. Um, and so if you look at it from a hospitalization standpoint, again, contending for the fact that we haven't met for, you know, a couple of months, uh, we did have a pretty high, you know, um, peak uh, in terms of uh, hospitalizations compared to where we were in early July. Um, you know, so we had something in pretty much like kind of the beginning of September where, you know, it was higher, uh, if not, you know, the earlier, uh, latter portion of August. So, you know, 391 uh, hospitalizations for the whole state of Connecticut. But uh, as you can see, it has been on the decrease here. Um, and so we're at actually, you know, 282. So, you know, definitely an improvement from before, but still it's high in comparison to where we were in July. So it's something very much that I like to use the analogy that anything's possible, but uh, nonetheless, a lot of our efforts, you know, from partners perspective, communication perspective, um, you know, with the face mask mandate, as well as, you know, uh, vaccination numbers um, that really have helped a lot in terms of really kind of thwarting what was really kind of a steep uh, increase in terms of hospitalizations and subsequently cases. Um, so then looking at it from the case rate perspective for the state of Connecticut, this is looking at for each city and town, the most recent data. And the great thing about these meetings is it comes right after the state health department's releases their Thursday evening data set. So uh, what we have here is a surveillance time period, September 5th to the 18th. You can uh, see, see uh, Norwalk is in the orange, which it was also the previous week. Uh, previous week, it was at 12.6. Now it's at 11.7 cases per 100,000. Um, if you look at it for roughly about three months ago, which is June 13th to 26th, you know, much different time in terms of case rates being substantially low uh, for everybody. And then, uh, about five months ago for April 11th to the 24th, you know, we were at 24.5 cases for hundred thousand population. So, um, you know, things are definitely, you know, at least decreasing from where it was before, but still there's, you know, decent amount of rampant activity in the state. And you can see how, you know, in terms of being the red, the highest category for the state's framework, uh, it's much more in the Northeastern portion of the state. So we'll get into that a little bit more, but, um, in terms of, you know, just the other data, you know, this case rates were at 11.7 with 3.5% positivity uh, for the overall pandemic for the data up to today, 12,469 cases, 232 deaths. Uh, if you look at it from the most recent two calendar weeks, September 5th to the 18th, uh, you can see actually there's a little bit of shift in terms of the age demographics. So 40 to 49 year old age group is at 20.4% with the second highest at, you know, less than 10 years of age at 16.2%. And then, you know, about 15% for 50 to 59, 30 to 39. So usual suspects has usually been uh, 20 to 29 to 30 to 39. So that has shifted a bit, uh, which is a little bit more suggestive of families uh, that have obviously young kids potentially in school systems, uh, as we've also just been seeing in terms of contact tracing as well. Um, and so from a vaccination standpoint, right, because this is what still one of our best tools to really mitigate, you know, seriousness uh, and complications from COVID, uh, you know, obviously infection, but also really kind of also helping reducing the risk of transmission, too. Um, and so you look here from the state health department's map of, you know, those receiving at least one dose of the vaccine or initiating vaccination uh, data up to September 22nd, you know, the city of Norwalk is at 73.98%. Um, if you look at fully vaccinated, we're at 67.37%. Uh, and so we're doing better than, you know, the state numbers, as well as the majority of the state as well, when you compare to other cities and towns. And you can see, and this is what I was trying to emphasize before, when those really high case rates, you can see how also the northeastern portion of the state has some of the lowest vaccination numbers as well. So kind of seems very strongly correlated as we've also been hearing in terms of the research and the news coverage. And so kind of further building upon this, this is coming from the state health department. This is looking at 
unvaccinated versus fully vaccinated individuals. They calculate a risk based upon every week. So this does fluctuate, but based upon the most recent data they supplied for today, um, you know, if you're unvaccinated, you're at five times higher risk of COVID-19 infection compared to somebody that's fully vaccinated. Um, you're at six times higher risk of COVID-19 death and then 13 times higher risk of COVID-19 hospitalization. So I think this is really a great analysis that the state has been providing to the general public to really get that message out there to get vaccinated. And it's been demonstrated by the data just on a weekly basis too. Obviously these numbers will shift a little bit based upon those numbers, but more or less emphasizing that similar point about hospitalization and death and how being fully vaccinated really protects you against those severe risks and outcomes. Um, so again, just emphasizing the point, check out our, you know, our COVID weekly report from the mayor and uh, it comes out on our city webpage, our social media, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, these are the links. Uh, it's meant to be a very helpful resource for the community to use that data and make some decisions, as well as communicate it and relay it to the general community and their partners and their clientele. Uh, so we get the word out there so people are informed and so they know to take the proper action and that we are not over COVID. Uh, even with this somewhat this better news as of late, you know, anything could change. So again, the analogy that I've been kind of using is, um, you know, we have kind of like a tinder box uh, set up and, you know, any sort of major change, like people suddenly not following face masks or something else, uh, misinformation that gets out of the community, that can very much catalyze an increased activity as we were saw in just only like the earlier part of this month and subsequently also August. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, kind of just shifting gears a little bit, this is mosquito surveillance, just for everybody's knowledge, we're not out of mosquito, se mosquito season two. Um, and so, you know, just keep in mind that the city of Norwalk had nine West Nile virus positive samples or pools of mosquitoes. Um, and we, uh, the state of Connecticut had three West Nile virus positive human cases. So they were in Bridgeport, Hartford, and West Haven. And what you can see here, just to emphasize this point in terms of mosquitoes, um, just kind of the, um, the prevalence of the, these positive mosquitoes is mostly in the, the western, if not southwestern portion of the state. So just want to emphasize that point as well. Uh, and to Deanna's point about flu season, you know, flu season has started. This is from the CDC, very quick surveillance uh, just by state. Uh, keep in mind that surveillance data from CDC for flu is a little old when it comes out. But looking at the week ending in September 11th, um, you can see how, you know, the state of Connecticut is at minimal, pretty much the lowest category in terms of flu, flu activity. So it's great to hear that there are still flu cases that are popping up here and there. Um, but uh, definitely better than some other states. Uh, and, you know, in the midst of COVID and the confusion that other respiratory illnesses can create, it's important to obviously have this in mind in the midst of even COVID kind of taking and running the show, so to speak. Uh, so that was a very quick and hopefully brief overview. Uh, we'll take any questions if you have any. All right, thank you. That was great, De uh, Deanna, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the group? Uh, Ms. Shanahan. I've got one quick question. So are there other variants that we ought to be listening for or worrying about? Or is there any information about that? Yeah, excellent question. So again, Delta, as you saw with that data, uh, you know, and it's accounting for other surveillance, uh, surveillance for other variants. Uh, Delta's running the show. Um, what's kind of the silver lining in all this, because you guys might have been hearing about like maybe Mu or, you know, C12 or Lambda or these other variants going around, a lot of them coming from South America. They do have a certain level of prevalence in the United States, but definitely not to the level of uh, Delta. And so, you know, and then also there's the other risk that, you know, variants are produced all the time, right? You know, somebody gets ill, the more people that get ill, and this is why this really emphasizes the need for prevention measures to be followed very strictly, and as well for contact tracing to be followed very strictly, and for vaccination to occur. Because the more people that get sick, the more opportunities that variants develop. And they happen all the time, they just don't have the perfect conditions to really spread uh, and increase, you know, their prevalence and, you know, like whether it's in a high density area like a city um, or if they have a higher transmissibility, like even more so than Delta. But we've been very fortunate so far that Delta has been more transmissible than most of the variants have been coming out. And so it's out competing. This is a bit of a silver lining, it's, but it's out competing the others. So, yes, we should still be very concerned about the risk of variants. Maybe not necessarily, you know, some of the other ones we've been hearing about, but they also have the potential to, you know, maybe cross over, whatever it is. You know, uh, COVID's obviously been in boxes of surprises and, so to speak, a Pandora's box. Uh, and so we really need to keep that in mind. But at the moment, um, you know, fortunately, Delta is running the show. And as long as nothing else is really higher in terms of transmissibility and doesn't have some other perfect conditions, like maybe a certain holiday that really helps a certain 
community and really help spread it in the community, especially those that are unvaccinated and more susceptible. Uh, you know, we're in a much better position than in some other ways than obviously compared to 2020 of last year when we didn't have the vaccine. So again, to summarize that, um, yes, we should still be very concerned about variants. Um, you know, there's always that risk of potential something else enters the picture, right? We all we thought we'd be COVID before before Delta entered the uh, the scene. Nonetheless, if we follow very strict prevention measures as still outlines, keep a close eye on the data because you know as the winter time, the fall and winter time approach, you know there's less opportunities to social distance, so there is increased opportunities for risk. Uh, and then vaccination, that's really our best tool that we should take full advantage of because that will really help mitigate. Uh, these opportunity for spread and also unnecessary outcomes in terms of hospitalizations and deaths and therefore reducing the number of cases that increase the probability that a variant will present that you know really kind of outcompetes delta and changes the game again and we're back to square one we really want to avoid square one because we've been through this rodeo a few times and i think we should all have learned we don't want to deal with it anymore we want life back to normal as much as we can so hopefully that answers your question it's revolution um, so especially for an audience that's watching, and since we're coming to a cold season, again, um, I would emphasize nutrition being the basis of what we're talking about, especially coming into a holiday season when a lot of people is going to be eating probably not the best stuff right now, right? So um, I think, again, for our innate immune system, nutrition, um, pushing nutrition, speaking about what we should be eating to the immensity as you talk about these um, testing and vaccines should be a part. Um, I will always and forever push that. Um, and I hope to an audience that will watch it. I think that our um, diets need to become a part of our everyday holistic thinking with mental mentally, all the whatever, um, our God-given innate uh, anti- antibodies in our body. We should try to push and promote that um, if we could. I know we put some things online, but especially coming into colder, thinking about some teas, some warm soups and diet, especially with Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that junk that we're about to consume. Um, I think this would be perfect timing to start that. Thank you. No problem. We do have our uh, healthy resolutions program that we offer um, in the winter time that we're going to be looking at. We're just I, I know you do. I, do. I just I would just I would just love it to be pushed to the immensity that you guys do everything else. Any other questions or comments for Brian or Deanna? All right. Can I just add one other thing? I'm That's looking nice. forward to the future to. Um, you know, as we still fight this pandemic, but to, to be fo to be able to, to again, focus on all of the various health issues that are really important to our community. And so, you know, because we've been in this unprecedented time, we've had to, to focus so much on this pandemic, but Councilwoman Revolus, you know, absolutely like we want to be able to, and we have been doing the work, um, but moving forward, you know, we're looking at our updated community health assessment, looking at our internal strategic plan and thinking about all the other community health priorities because there are many of them. All right, and I appreciate you saying that. We do have a lot of issues that also even connect to why there would be some situations to what we're dealing with right now. Like if you're um, hypertensive or diabetic or heart conditions or ag asthmatic, so on and so forth. So again, if we just thank you for saying that, we have a lot more different um, ailments that would even cause a perpetuation of this. In reality, if we can just get us holistically mind, body, and soul, everything from, from hair strand to toenail, take care of that. And part of the majority of that is what we eat. It's all what we eat, period. It's, it's just what we eat, period. Any, uh, any remaining questions or comments? All right, uh, again, Brian and Deanna, thank you so much for uh, putting these presentations together. Uh, it's been some time since we met. So um, uh, Deanna, thank you for taking back over the committee. I know you don't like to deal with me, but I'm sorry, we're, we're back. <laughs> it's 
not true. <laughs> yeah, we, we love having you. Um, and I guess with that, do we have a motion? Uh, Ms. Re Ms. Revolus fired that one up. <laughs> adjourn. <laughs> all right, motion to adjourn. Thank you, thank you so all, much. All, all, in, all in favor? All in favor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Uh, good night. Bye.